Welcome to Kingdom of Context. I am Sean, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for a wonderful roundtable discussion with good brethren on the nature and relationship of the Father and the Son as we see them in Scripture. And I'm excited that everyone is here to join us. Looks like we already have a healthy live chat. Big shout out to all the moderators that are here tonight. Thank you so much for keeping the live chat nice and calm, keeping all the spam bots out. Unfortunately, the spam bots are growing as we grow. I don't know how to stop that. YouTube's not answering my emails about that. So, Thank you so much for your help getting all the spam bots out. And if you guys haven't already, I'd highly encourage you to download a Kingdom and Context app. It's uh, in the Google app, the Google Play Store and the um, Apple Store. It's free to download. And as you saw from the commercial, it's uh, there's a fun, a lot of fun features on there as far as learning scripture, being notified of our videos, because unfortunately, YouTube is not faithful in notifying our audience of our videos. So this is kind of shortcuts that as well as you can communicate and uh, interact on the community board as well as our news articles and talk with other members or find fellowship through the fellowship finder. So we're even adding new things all the time. The, the latest build that we're currently adding is uh, a, a wonderful verification system for ministries and businesses on the fellowship finder app so that people can find you and interact and either support your ministry or interact with your business. So we're excited about that. But um, Oh, and if you haven't already picked up our first Enoch contextual study guide, it's it's a lot of fun. People get a lot of good reviews on Amazon. Um, that's also in the video description below. So if you're interested in the book of first Enoch and you want to see all the scriptural parallels with the American canon of 66, we've got them in there for you. We've even got color coding just so you can find the context and what Enoch's talking about, whether it's the Messiah, whether it's the law of God. Yes, he did observe, teach, and practice the law of God pre-flood, or whether it's uh, prophecy about the end of days. We've got them all color-coded, make it easy for you to read and understand. So check that out if you're interested. But guys, I'm excited about tonight. We have a wonderful panel that we're going to bring on. And without further ado, we will bring on Dr. Douglas Hamp. Hello, sir. Welcome. Oh, hey, thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. Awesome. And we also have uh, Scott Harwell. Welcome, brother. Yep, uh, you're still on mute here. Let me take you off mute. Are you off mute? Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. There we go. Welcome. And then we also have from hanging on his words, Ken Heidebrecht. Hey, brother. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy that everyone got to join us. So I, I think tonight um, we were wanting to talk about, obviously, the title is, is Yeshua Yahweh. Is Yahweh Yeshua? Should I, can we switch him around or is, it, is that a no, no? No. Who cares? The same. <laughs> okay. Well, I... I I think that there's a distinction. I think Ken thinks there's a distinction, but I think Scott and Dr. Hamp, you guys think there's not a distinction with, within this topic. Is that right? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's what we're, we're going to discuss, <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just to give people an understanding, because the title is kind of vague on the thumbnail. So just to let them know a general premise of where we stand, we didn't intentionally put 
Ken and I on one side and you guys on the other side. I think that's just the way it worked out on the screen. But uh, but before we get started, Dr. Amp, would you like to just share with the audience, in case they're not familiar with you, a little bit about yourself, your background? Sure. Uh, I'm the senior pastor of the Way Congregation in Lakewood, Colorado. So if you guys are close to Denver, come and check us out. We'd love to have you. We meet every Shabbat, every Saturday at 1030. I am a um, graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. And that was uh, an incredible time of study for me. I later went on to get my PhD from Louisiana Baptist University, uh, also in Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Uh, so I studied lots of ancient languages, and uh, they've been a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm really glad for the experience, and God has taught me a lot. Uh, somewhere around uh, 2013, 14, 15, somewhere in there, I really started realizing that... Um, that the feasts, Sabbath, and clean eating were actually for me, <laughs> and not just something that were for the Jews. And uh, so that, you know, kind of led me down the path that I'm on right now. And in 2016, I started the Way Congregation, and uh, that's where I've been. And and I write books, and I have uh, my own show. And so, um, awesome. So that's me, <laughs> Doug. I remember you doing that, getting into the feasts and the dietary instructions. Yeah, I'm so happy. When well, I was thank like, you. Yes. Yeah. 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 walk around every day thinking he was going to get raptured. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, it was a lot better back then too. I, I'm thinking about going back. <laughs> That's funny, Scott. Would you like to tell us about yourself? Uh, yeah, you know? I'm just I'm just a lawyer. I don't have a full time ministry. Uh, I've had people offer me money, and I'm like, no. I I, I do my day job as 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 a lawyer. Um, I am the son of a paper mill worker who got radically, I guess, uh, uh, he got saved in a Southern Baptist church in 1971 when I was two years old. Um, he repented uh, as well as he was taught, quit drinking, smoking, dancing, you know, those type things. Uh, truly walked out the walk. My uh, Everybody that knew him said he was the most humble man they've ever met. No one has ever said that about me. So... But I did inherit my father's passion for studying the Bible. Unlike uh, Dr. Hamp here, there are two-year-olds right now who know Hebrew and Greek better than I do. Uh, so that's just not been something I've delved into. So I was born and raised in dispensationalism, never understood how anybody could believe in like Roman Catholic or her some of her daughters. Uh, replacement theology nonsense, but obviously I viewed uh, the Jews as Israel. I viewed the church as a separate entity. Unlike my friend, Dr. Hamp here, I never believed in the pre-trib rapture because even as a child, I could read second Thessalonians chapter two and see that that didn't make sense. Not, not, not dissing on anybody, but uh, I would argue with my dad about it. And my, my dad never made it. He believed in the pre-trib rapture. He wrote two books, actually three, but he never made it an issue of division or like something to divide over. So I did inherit that from my dad. I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm a fully recovered former leaky John McAuthorish Calvinist dispensationalist. And I say fully <laughs> recovered. I am never going back to that. I now understand it was the feast that got me, man. I was a geek on prophecy. I've always been a prophecy geek. Born and raised reading John Walbert, Charles Ryrie, you know, Hal Lindsey, uh, Cheney, uh, Pentecost. That's that's what, you know, I just love prophecy. And then I just started like it was the late summer, early fall of 2017. I don't think that's coincidence, by the way, that I was led just to start looking into what I then knew or were called the Jewish feast. About a day later, I'm like, these are not Jewish. Within a right. month or two, I was like, well, if they're not Jewish, that means Sabbath is also not Jewish. And then a few months later, I'm like, well, maybe I need to take pork and shellfish off the menu because it's not food. And I like to say, and, and I've, I went through my Torah terrorist stage, I like to say that really the only thing that has changed about my basic understanding is when I gather and what I don't eat and maybe wearing tzitzit. Um, but with that, obviously, has come a deeper study. And, and even on this topic... Uh, uh, I would like to say I'm a fully cover, recovered Trinitarian, too. In other words, I do not believe in three separate persons. I don't even believe in three separate, two separate persons. I only believe in two separate gods. And so that's what we're going to be discussing about, uh, discussing this evening. So 
I, I've listened yeah, to your exactly. and and I don't think I've ever heard anybody. Uh, uh, so that's sort of my background, and I'm just a lawyer. My wife, uh, we've been married since I don't know 1999. We got three boys, and uh, I'm just I study the word as a hobby, and I started doing a radio show. And as part of that, I hosted I've hosted like Rico Cortez, Halisa Elwine, uh, Dinah Die, uh, John Pounders. Curtis Reed, Michael Oman. So my, my, my format is not teaching. I've done one teaching in my life. It was just on the house of Israel and, and the ecclesia of not being a new entity. So I'm not a teacher. I'm a chatter. So this is my wheelhouse, if you will. You guys are all okay. teachers. So <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. We're, we're happy to have you here. And uh, before we fully get going, a lot of, of the audience may already know Ken Heiderbrecht, depending on his words, but brother, tell us a little bit about yourself in case they don't know you. Yeah, sure. And thanks for sharing everything you guys already shared. Um, yeah, I'm a believer in God. I'm just a normal dude who realized one day that there is a God and that there's more to this life than what I had originally been taught growing up in churches. And so I called out to that God and I asked him to please reveal to me what it truly means to live this life as he, you know, willed it for me to do. And so that prayer was said in 2012 and it was answered rather immediately, I came into contact with several different um, people. Rob Skiba, the late, great Rob Skiba, one of his ministries uh, truly impacted my life. As I was telling Doug Hamp before we got onto the live show here, him and Rob Skiba had the show Quest for Truth and just that dynamic of the two of them going back and forth, exchanging in a brotherly manner their opinions on what they saw in scriptures, depending on what it was that they were studying at that time, um, was kind of the impetus that spurred me on to wanting to do something similar to that. So when Sean and I eventually met over years uh, later after this prayer was answered, we decided, yeah, why don't we start a show that's similar to that quest for truth? Um, but maybe we'll look at some of the extra biblical books that were removed because we had come to a, a pretty deep passion on those books as well, but believing that some of them are pretty relevant uh, scripture too. So I want to thank you, Doug, for that. Um, and it's just been, yeah, an ongoing journey of, transitioning from certain things I used to believe to not believing them anymore to just constantly morphing um, kind of my apologetics and just my view on how I understand the scriptures in a comprehensive manner because that's that's kind of how my channel has has been born out of this idea of presenting the scriptures in a comprehensive contextual concise manner that people can understand it clearly um, without any ambiguity that's that's my hope when I when I release a video so that's been me in a nutshell. Just love God. Love having discussions like this. And I love it when they're fruitful and kind and, you know, don't get off into the weeds of the heretics and the ad hominems and stuff like that. So I appreciate that you guys are We've, we've had some mature, those, but we're, we're going to do our best to avoid, <laughs> to avoid all that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Pastor Doug, my wife wanted to tell you hi. She used to attend your church back in 2017, I believe. Oh, wow. And uh, she, she um, came down from Fort Collins area and uh, to, to oh, your yeah. Denver church. And, okay. and so she uh, wasn't able to continue making that trip as time progressed, but she just wanted right. to give you a quick shout out and say, hi. okay. I think I remember her. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> very and cool. I think it can be very fruitful. Um, and uh sean i do you are you do sometimes have the patience of a saint i've watched some of your discussions with more of uh i guess traditional christian theology on the torah i think you do a wonderful job on that uh and um I, I, yeah i think we can have a really good discussion your recall i told you this on the phone your recall of scripture book chapter verse is is way superior to mine so you know I'm not gonna bow down to you but but Excellent yeah, job in your study. So I just jokingly say I'm a word nerd. That's all it is. I just love yeah. it. I love the Bible. I love our Messiah. I love our Heavenly Father. And uh, I feel like they gave us words. We should be able to understand them. So I need to keep it in context, you know, and just I'm a word nerd about it. But yeah, let's let's open up. What, who would like to start first? Um, well, let's I want Dr. Ant pray for us tonight because I need prayer not to get too passionate <laughs> and animated. <Okay. laughs> Please, yeah. Dr. Ant, would yeah. you play for us? Sure. Father, we're, we're all after the same thing. We want to know you. We just want to uh, live out your word. And so we thank you. We hope you'd we pray you'd help us to understand um, you and uh, just give us patience with one another and that we could open up the scriptures and just see what you have to say in your great name. We pray. Amen. 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 All right. Dr. Hamp, would you like to start? Can I uh, point on the topic? No. Well, did you want to go, Scott? 
No, it's not that. Let's uh, let's just talk. Let's start before the beginning, if we can. In other words, and I in think, the beginning uh, was the word. <laughs> no, no, no. That's in the beginning. Let's start before the beginning. But let's go back to eternity uh, past. Uh, and 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 Sean, you're. I think it's Psalm two. When uh, the sun, it says the sun is brought forth. Uh, well, it's uh, verse seven, Psalm two seven. He talks about you know. Yeah, um, can you to pull it angels. out? Sure. Yeah. I didn't realize you were asking me to put it on screen, but yeah, let me let me uh, put it on screen real quick for us. No, I, I just think for the audience, if we're talking scripture, you know, sure. they can see it and see it in context. <laughs> All right. So here in Psalm 2, is this one you're thinking about? Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. You're, you, you're my son today. I've become your father. Um, and so, again, so with, I think from listening to your past videos and, and your, I'm at, I think I'm at an advantage because I've listened to several of your discussions with others on this. Um, that you, I think we're all for an alignment. Ken, I'm not sure about you. I haven't listened, but I think um, I think we're all in alignment that that this this passage right here is talking about before the creation, before in before Genesis one. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm still kind of to be honest. I'm not 100 percent sure because I've seen. I can't remember where it is. I think it's an Acts. It might even be in Hebrews. Sean, you know, we can refer to the the word nerd over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the encyclopedia um where are you going it, it talks about thinking? how this passage was fulfilled after the resurrection like this very i can i'll try to pull it up i can't remember if it's an axe oh it's oh but... you're you're thinking of a uh, hebrews 5 verse 5 yeah is it Six. is it that one yeah or no yeah hebrews 5 so yeah. i think doug um, and doug and sean and i are all that this that the sun was was in eternity uh Again, the the Christian traditional Trinity doctrine has a co-eternal, co-equal, co-existent uh, approach to the, explaining this, and and I mean at some point in time, and I, again, I guess this question is for Sean and Ken. Do y'all just point blank? Do you two believe that the Son Yeshua was created? Before I, before I get to that, um, okay. I just want to clarify just, something that I do believe. Come back that, later and answer it, okay? <laughs> yeah, sure. I just I don't want the audience to somehow think all of a sudden, oh, Ken didn't believe that Yeshua pre exists. No, no, I, I do believe he existed in the beginning before the heavens and the earth were created. I do believe at some point in that time period, if you want, want to call it that, he existed with the Father. Um, that's a spirit being, from what I understand. Um, not as the father, but as a separate entity that came forth from the father. So the verbiage of him coming forth from the father to me makes it sound like the father brought him into existence. If you want to call it creation or well, I, I don't want to call it anything, Ken. I won't. I, I want to. I won't. This is what no, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm just what do you generally. call it? I'm, yeah, I'm going to call it like I, I told Doug. I can bring forth nothing except bodily waste because i am a finite creature within the space time domain what do you call it no i i call it um sorry i'm still looking at it's acts 13 i think is what i was trying to get okay. to before um yeah so this is the the semantic game right um mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. no no i i i, I say the father i say yah most high elohim just i'll answer this for me Mm -hmm. brought forth from himself what is referred to as the son okay sure and yeah, what what it. what words he, the word of, of of yah the word of god brought forth and and again i was talking to doug about it like proverbs 8 similar if not the exact same language is used yah didn't create wisdom understanding counsel power knowledge it was brought forth out of him. It's not something new, like there's a little wisdom baby or mm -hmm. a knowledge baby or a council spirit or separate spirits. This is this is what Yah Elohim in eternity outside of the time domain always was, is and will be. And so that's my understanding of, of when it talks about the sun, 
not as a second person. Yah, the Yah Elohim, the Most High, Almighty, is not a cosmic baby daddy of Jesus. So that's sort of a, a crude way to say it. But he didn't have sex with himself. He didn't. He didn't create a second lesser Elohim, although in his fleshly state, certainly the son was less, and, and he's describing in this, time, in this time domain, less than the father, no doubt. He's, very, he's limited himself. He's emptied himself. Like right now, I could freeze, and y'all could take mm -hmm. a screenshot. That's an image Scott, of dude. me. That's an image of me, but it's not me. It's not all of Scott. Okay. So what you, a... Back to the question to you, what, how would you explain what this verse is saying, created or not? I, first of all, agree. Well, I should say I agree with you that Yahweh did not procreate with himself. Yes. So I, is I, the son created being or not? It's, that's, I, I mean, I, it's Scott, a Scott, Scott let's, let's let him answer you. A big lawyer. He's not answering. Okay. Just, just, well, just, he is. There, just, but, he's getting um, I personally have no problems with what Arius promoted in the third century. Who, who is that? He, he's the guy, JW. He's basically. the guy who essentially was up against all the other council members at the Council of Nicaea. As wait, wait, you and have was, witnesses interpret John 1? There's variants of it that they... Sure, sure. Um, so, so Yeshua I, I is him. a Elohim, so is he created is what I'm asking you. Again, guys, I this is no what I do for it. a living. I and no and right now, I put it. you on okay. the witness stand, and y'all can do it to me. It's a yes or no question. Was Yeshua a created Elohim or not? We can all agree Satan was. Y'all do agree that Satan was created per Ezekiel 28, correct? I yeah. think all the angels were created on day one. Yeshua was okay. brought forth from the Father or created whatever semantic term you want to use before mm -hmm. day one. Not what I want to use. I'm, I'm you telling you my answer. Yeah, he's not answered yet. <laughs> Scott, created or not. I, I, we're, we're trying. Just give us a minute. We're trying. Mike, can I speak? Of course. You're, you're up, Ken. Okay. Go ahead, brother. I have no problem personally using the word create. I don't believe it diminishes Yeshua in any way. I don't believe it lowers him in rank, authority, power. What's the text, um, let, let, let him finish, forth, God. God he came finish. forth from creation. The Father brought him forth. He's the only begotten son. That has and a meaning too. What does the text say though? Does it say create or not? It says that he was begotten. Yeshua not says created. he was begotten in, in John chapter three. So, not however, one uniquely made, created, came forth from the Father. The Father was, I believe, the Father was alone by himself in eternity okay. before the heavens and the earth were created. He brought forth his Son. So, if we want to say create, um, came. I forward. don't want to say create. Like he snapped his fingers, he was there. Like however, how, however he made the angels, you know what I mean? Like snapped his fingers. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thought... I'm just, I'm just trying to say, like I, I can concede to saying, I don't know because I wasn't there. Well, like, what does the there. text say though? Well, the text doesn't. I don't believe the text, the text doesn't say. In my opinion, tons. It does of not detail. say he was created, so we should not say that Yeshua, the Son was created. Otherwise, that is the definition of eisegesis. Reading your uh, understanding. Did your, did your, your understanding father begot you? Created. Did your father begot you? Or were <laughs> of you course begotten? not. My, my father is a human and had to procreate with my mother, who are both created beings, and I'm, a, I'm obviously their product. But we're talking about an infinite, oh, eternal, almighty. So you were begotten by your father. No, 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 no. We're talking about an infinite being. Yeah, Jesus and now you're trying to draw us down to creation no hang on scott I, on three. I put this on screen for the audience to follow what we're talking about here so we've got um this is just brown drivers i don't i don't know if anyone has a preference but the idea of a begotten and that how that word's used in the hebrew and in, in psalm 2 7 is to bear to bring forth or to begets so we see that used of human relations as well but like i said there's a strong case to be made that this this context is actually referring to the the resurrected nature of yeshua um, at his resurrection. I personally don't see a text telling us exactly if or if not Yeshua was brought forth by the Father before the world began. Scott, since this is clearly a big point for you, do you have an let's, actual verse that tells you directly that he was well, not brought well, forth? Let's look again? at, um, again, the analogy I'm going to draw. I think we can probably all agree that Yah and eternity. Uh, uh, go to Proverbs you, 8. Proverbs 8. Okay. So you, Wis so wisdom, your, understanding, wisdom. knowledge, all these, the, the six spirits of Yah, 
Um, and so my, so my question is, is there a direct verse that you have that tells you if, or if not, Yahweh was brought forth before the world began? You sure? Uh, well, of course, because through him, he created all things. So, of course, if through Yeshua, he created all things. All things were created by him and through him. So we either throw that text out and don't don't believe Paul. Okay, that's, but that's not what I asked that. you. Yeah, I don't know the scripture and verse. You're the word nerd, but there, it's somewhere. Well, I mean, well, no, no, hang on, hang on. I'm just saying if we're gonna if we're gonna stand on the art, you asked our argument. Our stance is I answered your question. If we could. Then. That, so is it no you, all you things reversed. were created by through so for creation to begin well, hang on can I clarify the question okay sure okay so I'm asking specifically not whether Yeshua was a part of creation or with creation was made through him by him for him I understand that I, I agree with that verse I'm asking before the world began so before day one in Genesis 1 1 there's a father and the son I think all four of us actually believe that or we I believe that Yeshua and the father were existent before the world began. I'm asking you, do you also, since since you are in opposition to us using the word created or brought forth from the Father before mm -mm. the world began? I don't have any problem with the word brought forth. Okay. So just that's let me get text. to the end of it. Let me get to the end of it for the clarification and then see if we can get an answer. So I'm, all I'm asking is if you disagree with that stance and you think that that in your stance, it disagrees with it i'm and you're asking for a verse that directly tells you if yeshua was created i've said that i don't i don't know of a verse that actually states that this is why i've said it's never been a big issue to me because the father didn't seem to tell us so this is where i'm asking you if you think that he was not and he always existed do you have a verse that tells you that again that i will use the text at my, yah elohim brought forth a son okay in eternity because again in the beginning elohim created and we do know and i think we can all agree that all things were created by and through yeshua correct do, do we all agree on that uh I, yeah I i'm just I, confused with your position i thought you guys were saying there was no two characters before the world began there's just that yahweh was yeshua so i'm kind of confused <laughs> on your stance well, well again if we're talking characters it, over and in, in, it talks about that Yeshua is the exact image, the exact representation character of the father. OK, in other words, so I don't believe in two persons, Sean. You're not debating or discussing this with a traditional Trinitarian. I don't believe in two okay. Elohim as you teach. You teach there's a father, most high Elohim, and there's a son, lesser Elohim. I don't believe that. I also don't believe in personhoods, if you will. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So uh, okay. I, I understand. Can you, can, can you define that a little bit for the audience? Like, what? Because you've you've already been speaking from Colossians one fifteen as if Yeshua was a second person. I did not. I made. said by, I said I, Yeshua I'm, the Son. Yeshua the Son. By and through Yeshua, all things were created. Correct. I get it. So, to the average person, that sounds like you're describing two persons before the world. No, began. I said Yeshua. Did I not? Okay. <laughs> did I so, say? So, did I say the Father or the Son? I said Yeshua. Okay. So you're so you're leaving the Yahweh character person, whatever you want to call it. You're leaving Ooh. Yahweh out of the so equation. Yeshua what is what Yahweh. Are we in that? What, what, Yeshua is Yahweh. Person. Hold on a sec. Let's let's clarify it for our audience. What exactly? What yeah. word? Please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, we're, it's a friendly debate, but we're still debating. Yes. Okay. So, um, I believe that Yeshua, Jesus is God. I believe that he is Yehovah, Yah, however you want to say it. And are we, I'm correct that you guys don't. Is that where we are? Okay. So, uh, very, is that very correct, simple. Yahweh and Yeshua. We, I think we believe there's two separate father and son. And you're saying and that, that there, that the son is also called Yahweh. Is that what you're saying? I, yes, I, I take okay. you know a little more of the traditional Trinitarian perspective, though I I can leave some of the particular language, but I think that's generally true. So okay, um, yeah. So just so we clarify, so we know, you know, what end of this spectrum that we're on. I think because I've done a lot of debates, and if we don't understand the question, then it's really hard to come up with yeah. an answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and you know, I think it's important to to just remind everyone that. 
you know, none of us uh, has ever seen God, right? We haven't, we didn't get to hang out with Jesus even, right? So there's a lot of stuff we don't know. We're arguing about what we've read in the scriptures and how to apply that, right? And so I, I'm definitely in the position that, that Yeshua is God, the Most High, incarnate, right? I see him as the second person. And I would suggest that uh, if we think of a flashlight, you know, you kind of have this this thing or <laughs> even nowadays a cell phone, right? Uh, so I got my cell phone, right? If this is the father, all right? And then if I put my flashlight on, I got this cool little thing, right? It's the the light coming out of that is is now the thing that makes the flashlight visible, right? So Jesus is the light. He's always been generated. He's always been, you know, brought forth. There was never a time when he wasn't being brought forth. And, you know, you can think of the sun in the sky, or you can think of a headlight on a car or a flashlight, whatever, you know, Yahweh, the, the father, I'm going to use that term, um, is essentially the flashlight. And then the light coming out of that being generated from that light bulb is the sun. And he's the, he's the one that makes the father visible, right? Because we do have scriptures that say that, that the father or say that God, right? Uh, is invisible. No one's ever seen him. That's what Jesus said. No one's ever seen the Father, ever. right? No one. So, and yet we we do see scriptures, right? We see the angel of the Lord all the time, and he's very, very clearly uh, defined as Yehovah. So we have to somehow reconcile this. How do we do this? I mean, we have clearly manifestations, theophanies of God. Uh, you know, Jacob is wrestling, and he's like, oh my gosh, I just wrestled god right and i saw peniel right i saw god face to face right and you've got uh manoah and his wife and you know they're the parents of samson and uh this angel of the lord shows up and then he ascends up into the in the fire and they're like oh no we just saw yehovah they say yud hey vav hey right so they're of the opinion that they just saw god right same with gideon you know he's like oh no i i saw god and i'm alive <laughs> am, I, am i gonna die right and, you know, so you have all these people that are seeing God. And, and I, um, I want to bring up a passage. This is from, uh, from uh, Genesis 48, where uh, Jacob is, uh, is blessing. Uh, is it, yeah, 48. The where, so he, yeah, he says, bless the lads, right? So he says, um, um, let's see here. So he says in verse 15, Genesis 48, 15. Uh, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. Right. So this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The God who has fed me all my life long to this day. All right. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 16. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Now, what's really interesting about that is if you look at it in the Hebrew, the, the word bless, it's singular which tells us that he's he's equating God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the angel. He's saying they are one and the same, right? So right there we have these very powerful theophanies, these manifestations before the incarnation of Yeshua. We have these, these um, manifestations, theophanies, Christophanies, whatever you want to call them, um, and we see God in a, some kind of a physical form um even so like, when sorry, do yeah you, do you, just to clarify maybe for the sure. audience sake, sure do you do you believe that there are angels separate to yahweh i do yes absolutely okay. so when it does say the angel of the lord you don't think it's an actual angel it's it's yahweh well i would suggest that it the angel of the lord is is in a class all by himself yeah because the angel but, receives but this... worship the angel well, the angel receives a an offering and you don't see that anywhere it's in, te in the text other than a burnt offering to the angel of Yah. And, and Doug, real quick, I want to back up when we're talking about theophanies, because those, and I understand people can certainly, uh, and most of Sean's audience and following from Ken is going to say that that's, you know, obviously not Yah, it's just an angel. Uh, but, and, and we're kind of skipping forward in creation now. I, 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 um, and, and I do want to get back to, to, you know, is Yeshua created or not? But, in a, in uh, Genesis 15, it talks about our, the word, our, our Genesis 15, Genesis 15 talks about the word of Yah 
And it talks about Yah appearing to Abraham. Uh, we have other examples where it's Yah, especially I think it's night, uh, Genesis 19, where, he, where Yah actually has lunch or dinner with 18, Abraham. Yeah. 18, yeah. And, and those aren't really, I don't think those, you can't call, I mean, it's, it's Yah appearing, and yet Yeshua clearly says, no one has well, seen the Father. And he also said, he also said, before Abraham was, I am, and I Abraham am. rejoiced to see my day, right? So when did Abraham see Jesus? When he, he had lunch with him, Abraham. That's when Genesis oh. 18. They had lunch well, together. They even had uh, meat and milk. Don't tell our rabbinic friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was not a, a rabbinic kosher meal. Uh, but they had lunch together, and then we see that the two angels keep going they go over to uh sodom and gomorrah and it says and and it says yud he it says yehovah remained there with abraham all right so and jesus said abraham rejoiced to see my day so i think he's very boldly claiming to be the one that had lunch with abraham the jews knew exactly what he was saying they had no what problem understanding and accused him of blasphemy when he would dogmatically state that he is I am. When he they said you you being a mere man, make yourself equal to Elohim to God. Again, anytime somebody wants to deny the divinity, uh, the deity of uh, Yeshua, just I mean the, the the Jews who understood better than any of us the rabbis of the day probably yeah. they understood scripture and the context yeah. way better than any of us. No, I don't. I don't agree with that. Well, so they, you I mean, they killed them, right? Above, That's oh? not very smart. That's not very wise to me. Well, they killed the son of God. Again, we that, we could argue about that, but what we can't argue about yeah. unless you just deny or think Yeshua was lying or no, misquoting no, I, or there are, We have let me, fin let me finish. Let me finish. Not allowed to talk. So. No, it's not that. Let me finish. Okay, okay. Is Yeshua said clearly, no one has ever seen the Father. So who did who appeared to Abraham? Angels. Angels. Where does it Wait. say that in the text? In the text. Let's go to the Genesis text. nineteen. Let's Genesis. I mean, 19, have either of you guys, Doug? I wanted to ask you this. Just no, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's Hold go on, to Scott, Genesis nineteen. I want to see the it's angels Genesis in the text 18, appearing Scott. to Abraham. Yeah, okay, come, it's come, I want to see. No, okay. no, can we please do? It? I'm not upset. We'll get, we'll get there. It's okay. <laughs> but where, my, no, my ears where does are it my ears are that? bleeding. I'm gonna have to. Turn As we say in Hebrew, leat leat. Okay, little by little. Okay, slowly, slowly. We'll get there. Shwaya shwaya in Arabic. All right, so we'll get there. All right, so Ken, I think maybe you could. Yeah, that's your thought. Doug, I just wanted to ask you, um, have you studied the concept of shiliach agency? The concept of shaliach? agency? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the shlichim are apostles, right? Shaliach just means to send forth, to, uh, right. to send. Mm -hmm. uh, right. To so, yeah. But somebody's being sent. Sure. So when the angel of the Lord comes, yeah, talking as the mouthpiece of Yahweh, mm -hmm. like if, if a king was to send an emissary to a distant land, saying you're going to send this message to this distant land you're going to go in my name my authority mm -hmm. when that when that distant land receives that emissary they mm -hmm. receive him as if it's literally the king you know, know that about ancient sure. cultures right sure i see that playing out exactly with yahweh and his angels he sends his angels yeah because he is too powerful right we're going to get to the point the discussion of how can yeah. this happen without people dying i don't okay. think we have to necessarily link in yeshua is the answer I okay. think literally you send angels and they talk for Yahweh on his behalf because he is too powerful to be seen. Otherwise, you where would destroy people. Where in the people. text, though, Ken, does it say, oh, hold or, on. or Sean, let me, where in the text does it say angels here? Where, where, just in the text, not your understanding, just the text. Well, it's, what it doesn't, does the text say? It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't in that particular part. No, it doesn't. But who, let me guess, let me ask you this. Yah appeared to Abraham, correct? I hear you. Let me, let me follow up the question with uh, one that relates to what we're asking is in, there's three people, there's three entities that appeared to Abraham. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So are they all Yahweh? Are they all Yeshua pre-incarnate? Yeah. No. You can see two of them leaving exactly. later on. Well, well, quit saying Yeshua. Don't say Yeshua incarnate. I'm talking well, Yahweh. Brother, well, we're, Doug, we're just you trying said to have no. a general conversation. You, uh, I'm interested to hear what <laughs> so, Doug has to say because he says no. But you, so, you think maybe he came with two angels himself? Yes. Or, so there are okay. actual literal angels created. So the text, with them? Yes. So the text says okay. three men 
None yeah. of them, but it says the Lord appeared, and then it this says three men. So then you you guys are also isogetically inferring that one of those three men was a pre-incarnate. Sean, son, if I if I could, um, one sec, Sean, if I could, do you mind if I share my screen? I have my Bible, and I can just can I walk us through that? Would you mind? Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me make sure it's big enough so you guys can. I'll see. Is this it. based off the the Hebrew Masoretic? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Veira uh, elav Adonai. Okay. So here we have Yudhe Vafe. Right. So, are we in agreement? This was Yehovah, right? Of course, it says Lord, but we see here the Yudhe Vafe. Apparently um, not. Yeah. No. That, that's in there. Yep. Okay. Do we, all right. We see so, it says that. all right. So, so the Lord Yehovah showed up. Uh, he lifted his eyes. He sees three men. Okay. We all agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he says, "My Lord." This is a different one. Just says. Uh, Adonai, okay, which is mm -hmm. a term for the Most High God, but you know he's maybe he's not sure at first. But does doesn't get... Sarah call Abraham her Adonai as well? Yes. No. Um, Here you go. She does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, no, she says Adonai, not Adonai. There's a difference there. Um, okay. So, and the Lord said to Abraham, right? So again, when it's all caps, we see in the Hebrew that it's Yud Hey Vav Hey. All right, so um, nothing's too hard for Yehovah. All right, then, all right, Vayakumu Misham Ha'anashim, right? So here we have, and the man arose from there, and they went their way, and the Lord said, shall I hide what I'm doing from Abraham? No, of course not, and he goes all this stuff. It says, then the men, the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before Yudhevavhev. Okay, but, so but not the not the Yudhe Vavhe that you said no one has seen though, right? Well, whoa, 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 this is why I, this hey, is why hey. one second, Scott. This is why I would suggest that this is this. I believe this is Yeshua. I believe this is a Christophany, right? Okay. Um, so, and this is where I would say when Jesus said Abraham rejoiced to see my day, he was talking about this lunch that they had together, right? That he actually got to see Jesus, right? Yeshua. Um, so that's what I would suggest, but I yield the floor. And, and, and Sean, here's what I'll point out. Yeshua as the son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ says, no man has ever seen the father. And again, we start using these father son terms and guys, everybody for your audience, Sean, I'm a lawyer. I'm passionate. I don't mean to be, I want to put some, a witness stand on the, on the stand and answer my questions. Yes, no. So that's my career. So I apologize. Hey. But and, when Yeshua, real quick, Scott, when, when the Yeshua time comes, said, please let me finish. Scott, when Yeshua Scott. said, "No man has seen the Father," Scott, okay? my brother, I'm gonna. I hate to do this, but I just before we keep going, I'm gonna ask for some decorum here because we want to have a general conversation. We don't want to interrupt each other. Um, I do want to let you finish, but I just want to let you know that your energy is awesome. We love it, but. If we're trying to answer one of your questions, I just I would respectfully ask that you let us at least answer before you come with additional questions or critiques of those answers. Well, How about that? I was all Sean, that time all I was doing was saying that Yeshua only said no man has seen the Father. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can agree with that, I, I assume. Okay. Now, I do think you agree? I, th I, th I don't that's a blanket statement that um I don't fully agree with i i do believe that actually moses saw yahweh himself um his back his literal back i believe he he made accommodations for moses to see that and make it happen so that he doesn't die um but yahweh in that passage in exodus says that no one can see my face and live so there's an element to his face yahweh god is light right he emanates light he's the most powerful thing in, in the heavens and the earth all all, all of creation Something about his face is no man can see. They will die. But somehow, I believe, through Yahweh's providence and ability to make it happen, he, he sheltered Moses in a way where he could see his back and he lived. So when Jesus says no one's seen the Father and John says no one can see God or no one has seen God, generally, yes, no one has. But Yahweh really? himself says, Yahweh himself says, no one can see my face and live. So I think... I think there's a bit of flexibility in terms of how to understand that. Sure. I also have a question for you, Scott. Who is in Daniel seven? Who is Daniel seen in this vision that he calls the ancient of days? The ancient of days. 
Okay. But in your prayer time, what, what would you call him? Okay. So then, right. So then when he sees the son of man, who's he seeing then? Well, that's the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. He Dex says he's the son of man. Days, right? Yeshua says he's the but, son of man. Okay. He but here the in this days, verse, so. it says the son of man approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Mm -hmm. Who are these two characters? Well, again, the ancient of days would be Yah, which no man has ever seen. Who is Daniel seeing? Okay. So who's who's the son of man that's being approaching the ancient of days in this passage here? Well, that's Yeshua. Okay. So now they've split entities. They, they share no, the same. No, they've thing. always been one, Sean. I'm not a Trinitarian. I'm I don't just trying to understand how you're I defining. I don't believe in two persons. I believe. Can, okay. Yeah, I hear you. Can again, you I don't one? believe separate entities are two persons. Okay, can you define how you're using the term one? Well, echad would mean one. Here, here's, here's what we have. Uh, here's a good example. We have um, the pattern we see even in Genesis, the pattern we see for the house of Israel, the pattern we see even for man after creation is one to one. Man was created from, from one, became woman and man, and they are to become one. Same thing with Israel. Israel was created as a singular called out nation. It was then split to, to multiply. And then we see in Ezekiel 37, when the, when the two trees or the two sticks again become one. So that's what I'm seeing is the this Yah in creation begot a son. In other words, not a literal son. But the way he the way he manifests, like, in other words, Yeshua is the exact image and representation of the father in eternity. If we use uh, what you would call a biblical cosmo cosmological uh, uh, creation system, eternity would be what exists out, not even the heavens, outside the heavens because they're created. So I, I, the way I understand it is Yah is in eternity outside of space time. Uh, and that is how he expresses himself as the father. And so when Yeshua says no man has seen the father, then when you bring up this passage in Daniel 7, when you bring it, there's two other passages, I believe in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, when it talks about they saw Yah sitting on the throne. It doesn't say they saw the father. It says they saw Yah sitting on. It doesn't say they saw an angel. It says Yah. Again, it says Yahweh. It says ancient of days in this one. Like again, Most High, Elohim, Elohim Almighty, Yah. Again, I don't think we just. I think we get more understanding, obviously, in the Gospels because from Genesis until Malachi, you. I think there's like four instances of the use of father where Yah says father. And then you have Isaiah nine, six, obviously where it's the eternal father. And Sean, I, I, I do understand your view on that, that that does not mean father as in the father referred to in, uh, in the gospels and in the uh, uh, Paul's letters and in revelation. So, I mean, I, I, I do understand and in, in how you interpret that verse, but he's also wondrous and only Yah does wonders. Dr. Dyer, how do you, could I ask how do you question? approach this first? How do I? Oh, yeah. If you have a question, oh. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you guys. <laughs> so um, what is it that you actually believe? Like, what are we debating the about? Father, like, and, father and son existed okay. as two separate characters before the world began. And Okay. And so who is yeah. Jesus? The son, of, the son of God set to be the Messiah and high priest of Israel. And what is Jesus? What essence is Jesus. Well, he, now, well what? He, he was in a spiritual nature, as First Corinthians 15 talks about. There's two natures in all of creation, the spirit okay. and the flesh, or yeah. the spirit and the earthy. He was spirit. He dethroned yeah. his glory, became the flesh of a man, manifest in the flesh, First uh, Timothy 3.16, and then lift, died, resurrected. Now he's yeah. glorified. He's yeah. quickened into another spiritual body, and that is his eternal body forever. And that's what we get to. Okay. That's so, the promise of the first resurrection for all the saints. All right, so... the. But your bottom line is that Jesus is a created being, very much like the rest of the angels. I mean, how is he different no. than the other angels? Well, because he was he was uh, before them and greater okay. than them, just like John says, okay. John John chapter one. Um, okay. But he was named before the angels, as in my opinion, uh, what he tells Pilate, John eighteen thirty eight, that he was uh, his his kingdom is not of this world, that he okay. was in authority over the angels before he dethroned and came as a man. Okay. 
So he's he's definitely speciality on him. We're not diminishing his speciality. We just don't think he's equal in authority to the Father because there's no scripture that ever says that, in our opinion. I, I I'm not agree. arguing. I'm agree. not arguing. Hold on, Scott. I'm not arguing that he's equal in authority to the Father. I wouldn't say that because Jesus. Himself well, if he's the same the person as greater. Yahweh. Well, I, I would, you know, this is where I think we go back to this whole uh, ancient debate of homoousis versus, you know, um, you know, they have this, you know, is he the one substance? And and I think I would say yes. I would say that that Jesus is in fact God. He's God incarnate. Uh, he is the second person of the uh, of the Godhead, if you will. Um, and no, sorry, do you yeah. just Please. do you believe that Yahweh? Okay, so do you believe Yahweh is the Father? Yahweh's the son like is that a name to you or is that a title like what when you say that Yeshua is Yahweh are you saying that Yahweh is the son Yahweh is the father so again kind of going back to my flashlight analogy and I know that no analogy is perfect but if I have a flashlight and, oh no I get that but know, like yeah. is Yahweh a name is, and if so and if, if Yahweh is a name and it's for the son as as much mm -hmm. as it is for the father then what is Yeshua's name what like How's he tie into that with the sonhood? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, How are you defining Yahweh? <laughs> yeah, I think that's well, what we're trying to figure out. Uh, the one before whom all things were made, right? I, well, you know. okay. So you mentioned the essence, though, right? Because that seems yeah. to be the the juxtaposition of the oneness usage of the word in, in context that Scott was using. So, like, what are you defining as the word essence when you say they share essence, and so therefore this? So, because what I'm hearing is, yeah. In, Please help me understand. I'm trying to hear the sure. view out. Yeah. That you're Dr. Hamp, you're describing that the father is not as we see it. We see a father and a son, and you're saying mm -hmm. it's always just been the son. No, is no, I'm not, not saying that. No, I, I okay. believe in the father and I believe in the so son. You believe in two characters. Two, I, I take just, I take a much more, you know, Trinitarian approach that you know there's okay. the father, there's the son, there's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> If you want to use the word person, whatever. And you think you think uh, that ontological yeah. nature was something different than the spiritual nature of the angels, and so therefore yes. it denotes a special ontological nature of the son. Yes. Very Do you believe he than the kept angels. that ontological yeah. nature when he became in the flesh and he was like 100% man, 100% God? Well, that's a little bit challenging because it does say that he emptied himself, right? The word kenosis, right? So he, so in some way, he emptied, you know, I think of it like a king taking off his robe to go hang out with uh the common folk you know and so how he did that i don't quite know but okay. he was able to somehow uh you know divest himself of that glory uh he came in the form of a servant and you know he was uh god incarnate right he is emmanuel he's god with us so yeah. um i don't well, think I agree that he's with that language created angel with us i think he is god with us now the word malach is just means a messenger, right? And it can be used for sometimes human messengers. Quite often, what we call angels, right? These these otherworldly supernatural beings, uh, Michael, Gabriel, Satan. Those are all you know angels. Uh, and then we have, of course, the malach Adonai, which is a very unique uh, individual, <laughs> and uh, he has all of the same. Uh, attributes as god if you wouldn't mind i actually have uh this pulled up and i could uh take us through if you're okay with that right now or i could do that later yeah let's go okay cool all right so um yeah this right here uh so the angel of the lord called to abram from heaven say abram do, you know don't lay your hand on the lad for now i know that you fear god since you have not withheld your son your only son from me Right now, I understand you're saying this is just an agent. I think we have so much language that says to the contrary. I've already gone through Genesis 48, uh, 15 and 16, right? The God before him, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, right? So again, this word bless here in the Hebrew, it's singular, which tells you that he's saying, may the angel bless him and may God and these two, God and the angel are in fact exactly the same. Um, then we see in Exodus 3, of course, the burning bush. I know you guys know this really well, but you have the Malach Adonai appear to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and then God called to him from the midst of the bush. So who in the world is in the middle of the bush, right? Well, yes, it's the angel of yes. the Lord who is God, 
right? And he says, hey, take off your sandals. Why? Well, because I am God, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the same God, and he's afraid to look upon God, right? And, and then and it says, Yudhivav said, I have come down to deliver you out of the hand of the Egyptians. Then Moses said to God, indeed, right? And so we have all this, this language where the person in the midst of the bush is the angel of the Lord, who is God, right? Um, we see... That's why you believe really Yeshua, though, right? Yeshua. I I do whoa, whoa, Yeshua. whoa. Yes. Well, he didn't oh, say I, that. But well, I, I believe does. Yeshua, sure. <laughs> I know, I know right? Scott doesn't, but I, but I do. So, um, I mean, I think it's I think it's the only logical solution that we have. Otherwise, hey, we got hey. some other person. But well, let me let me just go on a little bit more here. Okay. So, I'll, I'll let you um, finish. Yeah. yeah. So, um, of course, there's lots and lots of passages. I don't want to go through all of them. But in in the book of Judges, right, we have the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Uh, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Right. The angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff. It was in his hand. And uh, Gideon's like, oh, no, <laughs> right? He, uh, he perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So he said, alas, O Lord God, the G, capital G-O-D, that is yud heh vav -Heh, Why is he freaking out? Because I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. We have a very similar event with Manoah and his wife. And uh, it's um, the, this angel of the Lord shows up. He, uh, and then Manoah offers a sacrifice to the Lord, to yud -Heh -Heh, And it says that the angel of the Lord went up in the midst of the, of the flame. And the angel of the Lord appeared to no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he had that he was the angel of the Lord, Malach Adonai. And he says to his wife, we, we will die because we have seen God. right? And his wife said, oh, no, if yud -Heh -Vav -Heh, if Yehovah had wanted to, desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. So they're equating yud heh uh, or they're equating God with the angel of the Lord, right? So mm -hmm. there's all this, right? Isaiah 63, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, the angel of his presence, that's uh, Malach Panav, right? So the angel of his, his face, his presence, saved them in his love and his pity. He redeemed them. He bore them and carried them all the days of old. Then we have in Zechariah, the angel of the Lord again. And who is speaking? The Lord. <laughs> but it's the angel of the Lord, right? And then, so the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So wait a second. Mm -hmm. The Lord is speaking to Satan and the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you. I mean, that seems weird, right? And so now he's speaking about himself in the third person, which makes great sense if you have God, if Jesus is God and God the Father is God, all right. And so, and so um, the angel of the Lord says, "See, I have removed your iniquity from you." Um, and you know, again, there's so many passages. I, I've got a whole lot more. Uh, I don't want to hog the show here, but but you know, there's just so much more that talk about how Jesus is in fact Yud He Vav He incarnate. Right. It, well, it, uh, he is uh, Emmanuel. Right. God with us. I mean, that's literally yeah. what that means. What happened to Yore Vave in these moments where Jesus became incarnate? Uh, well, he's still wherever he hangs out, <laughs> you know, and of course, he's that's everywhere. almost it's almost well, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious. Right. He does. He's not hanging out in some corner of the universe somewhere. Um, God is all in all. God is the tenth dimension, if you will. Right? We're all sort of hanging out but, in Him, which gets very I esoteric. That. I understand. Yeah, because right? I, yeah. I saw I saw Daniel and, and Elijah and Enoch tell, showing me visions of a specific entity that was called the Ancient of Days and the Lord of Spirits, to whom another entity walked up to him under his authority. Yeah, it's called the Son yeah. of Man. Yeah, and 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 to Ken's point, I I think it's I think it's a, a fair and strong possibility that when it says that no one has seen God, it may be talking about not seeing his face, right? Now, we could okay. sort of debate that in spite of what we're doing. But, um, you know, for example, when, when Ezekiel, he saw somebody, right? How could Ezekiel look at God, but Moses couldn't look at God? I would suggest in the that spirit. seeing, yeah, the, it's kind yeah, of like, say, you know, we're all looking on a, on a, a computer, you know, a screen right now. And, you know, you're seeing us, but you're not really seeing us. Right. Well, uh, 
back know. to my point in Genesis, yeah. it says Yah appeared to Abraham. It doesn't say the angel, guys. Well, it says you three men. It text, says three it men, right? No, yeah. it says Yah appeared, and then it, it says say three men, men and we've already yeah. went over that. I know. But, can I get you guys' we, opinion on this? Because well, can I get an opinion on the Hebrew word Elohim and its multiple uses in Scripture and well, context? Well, it can mean the Most High. It can mean certainly created angels. It can mean mm -hmm. even the spirit of Samuel is called an Elohim. Um, the, the, an the basic, Elohim yeah. can, the basic can, meaning can, is it's just mighty one. That's that's the unit. Mm -hmm. That's the catch all meaning of the word is mighty, one. mighty, mighty like Hercules or mighty like a ruler. Could be a, as Scott was saying, could be a judge. Um, it could, could be, be a dead spirit. It could be gods with a little G. Could be right. the God with a big G. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, but but the base meaning of the word is mighty one. All right. I get so it. that's how it's supposed to be used. So, so this, this is what I'm saying. Morning. All those verses you brought up that uh, that are saying angel of the Lord, and I'm not sure which translation we're using because it looked very much like an Aramaic Targum. But that's all those Hebrew. verses that you, <laughs> yeah. it was a Hebrew. Yeah. It's the. Original, you mean you're so. saying Aramaic is a ver is an extent of Hebrew, or, or are you using a Hebrew Targum? I'm not using a Targum. I'm using the Hebrew. Masoretic. Yeah, they're you're, you're using the Masoretic, though. Okay. Which is Hebrew. Well, because you I know mean, there's other, there's like the, the Septuagint has different wording in certain places and doesn't well, that's doesn't put the Fine. same capitalization. Dr. Dr. Hamp knows stuff like that, dude. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Come okay. on. Yeah. yeah. All right. Even I know that, and I'm a dumb dumb. You don't have to <laughs> yeah, like I, condescend. I hear you, Scott. No, no, no. I'm trying okay. to say, no, yeah. no one's trying to condescend. I'm yeah. trying to define our hey. terms, my brothers. So, real quick, if we're yeah. using, if we're talking Hebrew, Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the definitions of terms used in mm -hmm. context. And, yes. and you you put forward all those scriptures on the screen to say every time those scriptures say the angel of the Lord, it must be talking about Yahweh himself in the version of a the Christophany. And I'm sitting here saying, well, I, I don't see that consistent with the use of the Hebrew word Elohe or Elohim. Well, we I were not even talking Elohim about the word Elohim. We're talking about the word yud Vafe. Exactly. Right? So Malach Adonai, but this is Malach yud Vafe. The, whatever Malach Yehovah, right, uh, is not okay, the but, same but as Elohim. All those, all those verses right. where he says they saw God and then the angel, and you're right. saying that use of the word God must be Yod I'm but saying it didn't say that in the text. It just well, said God, just said Elohim. Jacob clearly defined it for us that the God, so the of, angel of the Lord, no, the face of wait, God, wait face, the angel of the Lord. So, so when, so in in, in Genesis 48, when he says um, mm -hmm. the God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac, the God who is Bless me all the days, or the God who is what has cared for me all the days me. of my life mm -hmm. with me, right? He says, "The angel of the Lord who has redeemed me, bless the lads." Right, mm -hmm. and he uses a singular verb. He doesn't say, you know, God and the angel bless plural the lads. Okay. He says, "Bless singular." Right, so the the blessing is one entity, and he gives us two different terms for that one entity: the God of Abraham and Isaac, and the angel. Okay. So, okay. you know, the angel, not some other angel. And we know, we know which angel because he wrestled that angel. And what did he say? He said, I just saw God, right? He says, Pani El, right? He, so he, he said he saw Elohim. That's for sure, right? Well, the face of Elohim. So yeah. what, is, what does it tell us angels in the scriptures are actually for? Their purpose of why they were made is verse 14. They're angels, ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation. I'm, so I, I guess my question, my big question is like, I agree. is there ever, because you used a lot of, uh, a lot of verses talking about man interacting with an angel of the Lord. Sure. Are there any verses in the old Testament where it was just an angel and not a Christophany? None. Whenever it says, Malach Adonai, I am not aware of any suggestion that it would be anyone other than, Let's say, yeah, if you want to use that term, you know, whether you think it's Jesus or not is another discussion. But I definitely think that it's it's Yudhe Vafe. It's it's a hey. manifestation of it's all you know a theophany, right? So. Hey, for Sean and Ken in Genesis 15 in the initial covenant uh, with with Abraham, in other words, when uh, Yah cuts the covenant, if you will, do y'all believe that 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 is an angel as well cutting the covenant, or is it Yah? And I'm going to I'm going to intentionally not use Elohim or God right now, because I think we can all agree. Yah would be the most high God, uh, the almighty Elohim. Who's cutting the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 for Sean first? Who's cutting the covenant? Yeah, with Abraham. 
Um, I I would say it's an angel there as a ministering agent of the Father. I don't think it's where the, does it say almighty, angel in that text? In the same way that we're semantically calling every other use of the word Yahweh uh, instead of an, an an agent sent to speak to mankind, like I brought Hebrews one fourteen up right now, that's their role and their job. That's that would be the same argument that you're bringing up for Genesis fifteen. So the, the, it'd be the, the same. It's the same text, argument that you're in the you're text. Where does it say angel? I, see, that, I mean, it I'm just sure. it doesn't. It does. I'm not sure how to. I'm not sure how to to um, answer you with the way that you want because well, it, you're it, well, you're hand, hand wave dismissing the no, actual not dismissing, context that we're trying to bring forward to say there's a definition of these words. And, for y'all, and you've already admitted that you cannot see Yod Whoa, 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 whoa! Again, no. I said Yeshua said you can't see the Father. Don't say that I never said you cannot see Yod do you you're equating the father to Yah, okay? And again, the father as expressed in God, us I don't, is outside. You now see, you're cutting me off now. I was quiet for a long, long time. Okay. Where no, in the text, I, please answer my question, does it say that that is an angel as opposed to the text says Yah? The overarching context of the book. Mm -hmm. um, where you guys plug and play Yahweh with Yeshua, you can't mm -mm. see you can't see not God you guys live. don't you can't do that, see Yahweh please. and live therefore it must be Yeshua I just I take what the text says as the angel of the Lord is an angel every time we see angel of the Lord or angels being involved with bringing messages showing up to prophets showing up to whatever they're literal ministers of the father okay. that's their Wait, that's why they up? were created that's why that's their their priests their ministers their various things you know they destroy oh, 185,000 name of uh, Syrians in the run of a night they do a lot of things. And so I just think a lot of people, like, unfortunately, they're a character in the scripture that kind of gets overlooked, in my opinion. And let's, so, let's, let's look at Genesis 15 real quick. Let's just look at the text. Doug, if you can bring it up. Sure. Or maybe Sean I'm, wants to. Scott, I'm, I'm the one that has the presentation, brother. While Sean's doing that, um, Doug, what, I know what your opinion is, Scott. But, Doug, what's your opinion on uh, removed books like Jubilees, First Enoch? Isn't that a different debate? <laughs> oh, yes. sure, sure. But <laughs> okay, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, I, I think it's very misleading to suggest that they're removed books. They were never added books uh, in the first place. So um, nobody in the first century considered those to be scripture. Um, really? No. According to like, you That's, mean like the Council of no. Jamnia, like the ones there? They didn't that? think those were scripture. They thought Who? that the canon that we have was the canon. And uh, okay. Enoch and all that, you know, I think those are very interesting books. I think they're significant and I myself study them and I've quoted from them, but I know would never call them scripture, God breathed canon. Um, you quote from them in, you, in teachings and stuff? Uh, yeah. So I've written a number of books and especially when I talk about the Nephilim, you know, yeah. for me, for me, they're, they're a good baseline of what people were thinking in the second, uh, second temple era. Now, Enoch, I think probably has the most going for it. Mm -hmm. um and so then you'd be you'd be familiar with how often the angels are involved with things right sure but i mean i, I you like don't the like book, those verses, but it's, but you like the it's, a, it's a problematic book i mean it's it is very much a problem but it must book. be good enough to put in book in your own books and your own teachings sure. but but i would use it as a secondary source maybe a tertiary source but not as a primary source the bible is it took a the primary time to source. actually write it well, I, I, I personally think I personally think that some parts of it very well could be from Enoch. The trouble is which parts, you know. Um, uh, so that that's the challenge. And um, but you, you know, but we don't have. Well, see, these books are not written in Hebrew. Um, Paleo Hebrew Jubilees is found in Paleo Hebrew. There's no such thing as Paleo Hebrew. That is okay. The earliest form of script of Hebrew. The earliest script of Hebrew. Jubilees yeah, it's, a, it's a Can we get back to it's Genesis 15? Like, it's like Times New Roman. Talking about Jubilees, please. Well, this on, this guys. matters let's, to let's Jubilees. Talk about 14. Is, let's talk about Yeshua Yah. This comes full circle to that, though. This, well, this no, because I don't. I, we Jubilees tells you it's angels going before we, Abraham. It's angels that went before angels, okay. and they literally we talk in the personal books, pronoun please. of we and us. We went before Abraham, us being the angels, because we're introduced okay. to the angels right at the beginning of Jubilees. So to me, I'm like, oh, that makes sense because I'm already reading in the canon of 66 that there's angels coming forward. But it's weird how it's worded because it seems like it's Yahweh talking, but it says an angel. But then when I read Jubilees, it's like 
there we go. It, they were angels coming on the Father's behalf for mankind. Uh, I don't have to plug and play Genesis Yeshua 18? into it. So the, father, about... the Father's not capable or he's limited? That sounds like not. No, 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 no. That's, that's a fallacy, buddy. That's not... I'm not saying he can't. He sure he can manifest however he wants. He can okay. snap his fingers and end all of creation right now if he wants to. But he did he say like he's going to do that? Is that what the scripture says he's going to do? Like Thanos. No. Yeah. Uh, can we get to Genesis 15, please? Yeah, we can. I just want to throw this out there as as we go forward. That um, it, it's interesting if we don't see any op, any if we're not if we're if we're not going to say that there was an opportunity in the Old Testament where angels actually come and interact with mankind. This gets into concerning territory because this is what the Sadducees taught. The Sadducees directly taught that they didn't believe neither the resurrection nor angels nor spirits. And so this, I actually debated a rabbi on my channel who believed the same thing. When I tried to, he said, no one has seen God. I said, okay, well then who was in the burning bush? Was that God or was that an angel? He goes, oh no, no, that was God. I said, wait, but you said five minutes ago, no one has seen God. And Exodus 33 tells us no one can see the face of God and live. But yet this... This angel's talking with Moses in the burning bush or, the, or whom he thought was God. And he goes, it was God. And I'm like, okay, but what if it was just an angel? He was like, no, no angels, no, no angels there. And I'm like, okay, that, that, there's no coherency in thought if, if we go with that because <laughs> we're not defining our terms. So it's well, just we're using this I generic mean, term well, God everywhere. So let's go to you know. Genesis 15 and define it. It says Yahweh, <laughs> enter, the word of Yahweh, then it switches to Yahweh. The angel is never mentioned in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, guys. That's why okay, I really want to go. We're talking is, about the first. We, we're talking about this the is the first same covenant. argument, brother. Pardon? This is the same argument. You're just using another example from a different chapter. No, no, I am not. Nowhere in Genesis 15, Sean, does it say the angel of Yah. Does it? Where you plug and play Yeshua, we I'm not doing that. Angels. Well, you kind of are, okay. though. No, no. I'm, dude, well, I am. <laughs> I'm saying Yah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But okay, you you're you're a normally so who's who's Yah here? Who okay, is Yah. So brother, brother, take him through the argument that you're trying to make, Scott. Okay, can we go back up to Genesis uh, 15? Uh, are verse you 1? are you looking at the screen, Scott? I got it on screen. I'm right? looking at verse 17 and 16. Okay, what what part of this chapter would you like to talk? Go about? Go back up to the top. Okay. Okay, so the word of Yah came to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Abraham replied back, O Lord, Adonai, Elohim. Then the word of Yah came to Abraham. I'm not seeing, and again, I'm just going to, let's just go through it to troll on down. And Yah, Yah took him outside. Nowhere in the text does it say the Malach or the angel. Abraham mm -hmm. believed Yah, and it was credited him as righteousness. Yah also told him, I am Yah who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. But Abraham replied, Adonai, uh, or yeah, Adonai Elohim, how can I know that I will possess it? And Yah said to him, so Abraham brought all these to him. Then Yah said to Abraham, verse 13. Yeah. So are, yeah, there, what, are you saying, let's, let's Scott, the let's word get, of the Lord, the word part of the word of the Lord is Yeshua because he's called the word in John 1? Is that kind of the link? I'm saying to make? it's the word of Yah. Right, so don't, is, don't, don't insert but angels come with right the now. word of Yah. Angels deliver the word from the Father. It's his word. He gives well, them the again, word. We, he brings it. That's how it works. We all agree that I would hope we all agree that Yeshua is the word. Yeah, he brought the word of the Father to humanity. Yeah. I don't think we're debating that Yeshua is the Word, the incarnate Word. What we're discussing. He's called it. It's one of his titles. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, even the ancient Jews believe that the Word he, was, well, they believed that that was God. So that's not something that we made up or Christians made up. I mean, that's okay. a very ancient so, teaching of the memory. Let's Memra. look at 18 real quick. Yeah. On that day, Yah made a covenant with Abraham. Again, right. this is Yah, not the angel of Yah, not even the word of Yah. This is Yod Hey Vav Hey. So, so now making Yod Hey Vav showing up. Hmm? So now Yod Hey Vav is showing up. And, and, He's and been showing up since first one, Sean. As who, though? <sighs> okay. As Yah. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Like Yeshua or literally Yahweh showing up? Yah. No man has ever seen the Father. Okay. You got you guys. Y'all seen guys that? Are, here's what you're Who's doing. You guys are taking a. You guys are importing Father 
sign into the text where the text just says word I, of Yah or Yah. I would not do that if I could get a good definition from you. About what? <laughs> About how are you using these terms? Well, Yah this, is the most high Elohim. We can agree, correct? Okay, but you, you seem to differ from Dr. Ham's view where you believe that the ultimate creator is not Yahweh, but he's something outside <laughs> of the story. Is that right? No, 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 no. no. Yah right. is creator. Totally Yah yeah. is creator. Okay, so the creator, Yah, is okay. appearing before Abraham here in your view? Yes. How? Well, the text says he did it. How? How did Abraham do it and live? Now it's Yeshua. That. That's the answer, right? Ah, again, you don't, you that's, don't like where, that's where y'all, I think, have some Catholic Trinitarian leaven. No, no, no. Your understanding. Let me finish. Let me finish. You asked the question. Yeah. Again, Yeshua only says no man has ever seen the Father. Except he him. doesn't say yeah. no man has ever seen Yah. He doesn't say well, no man he's has seen ever seen him, though, seen right? Him. So okay. Well, okay. Again, I think we're getting himself, somewhere. Or... I think we're getting somewhere. So you're defining Yodevave or Yah differently from the term the father is that right no the father it would be like you like to say about the husband you just okay? did though father would be did. metaphorical okay how okay i'm i'm trying to explain to you you're getting frustrated the father am, exists I outside am, of time no, and creation okay that's, that's, that's the just, father go, said, unknowable yeah. unsearchable we can't even figure out eternity for us to even think we can First remotely 5, understand eternity is crazy First Timothy five sixteen. Sean, you want to pull that one up? Is that the un, the invisible? Yeah, one? invisible. Yep. Yeah. So the word in the Greek there's eros. Is it Doug? Eros. Can't remember what it is. Um, let me. From what I remember, it means invisible. Yeah. It can mean invisible or unseen. And I don't. So people, when they say that he's the image of the invisible God or unseen God, they say that as like, okay, so God is like the invisible man. He he's like see through transparent like there's there's no actual tangible nature to him and i'm like well no if we understand where he resides and how he how i believe he came down where does he reside where does he reside in in the highest heavens on his which is where in heaven above the firmaments oh is that like the dome you mean like the flat earth dome like that without going into the, that whole debate we can, we can do that. <laughs> if you want we can do that some other time it's a great <laughs> fun conversation sure from yeah. what i recall you don't really like it because your interactions with rob but um that's true. I, wherever heaven is that's not we don't need to wherever daniel saw the all the ancient of days sitting like okay. i mean he's clearly in an unapproachable light this is the idea is because no man can go there just like yeshua talked about no man can ascend to heaven not in the mortal flesh in the same way, no man can see the true pur purpose and power of the ultimate almighty yeah. and live. So therefore so, he sends his yeah. agents to go interact with mankind. Well, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I meant first Timothy six sixteen. That's my, my mistake. Oh, you got it. I'm That's sorry. what I have on screen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. The, the Zohar quotes this exactly word for word, you know, so uh, it's kind of a misnomer that the ancient Jews didn't believe in uh, three part, you know, to you a Vave, whatever you want to call it, or three essences or persons or whatever the right, right word is. But but they they clearly understood this. They they knew that Yah had a son. They stated very plainly, uh, and and they quote this uh, specifically uh, that you know uh, the the one that we're talking about. So you know, so obviously we I think we're on agreement that there's definitely some mystery about the the father or or Yud Vave. You know exactly how he's going to manifest, but uh, I think from what we've seen from the angel of Yudhe uh that's an entity that is very different than your average angel. Um, you know, we only have two angels mentioned in scripture Michael and Gabriel, and maybe Satan if you want to throw him in. But, um, you know, so this angel of the Lord is, is a different entity altogether. Uh, and then, you know, when we get to the New Testament, of course, we're, we're told that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, right? So um, we have there a very powerful evidence that this word, the memra, the devar, the logos, this is God in the flesh, God made manifest, God incarnate. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't have any problem saying that it was uh, Yeshua that showed up, 
you know, in all these different places, call them theophanies, Christophanies, whatever. In the Hebrew Bible Old Testament, we're talking about uh, we're talking about Jesus ultimately. Okay, I have a quick question for you, uh, Doctor Hamp, real quick. Sure. If we can pull, yeah. pull this up, and since we're talking and trying to define the term God, okay. So in verse six, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Justice is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hate witness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed mm -hmm. you above your companions with the oil of joy. Okay. So who are, who are the two gods being referenced here? Well, um, I mean, didn't Jesus use this? I, if I, if I remember. Hebrews chapter um, 1, verse 9. Oh, Hebrews. Okay, yeah, right. So, um, you know, so that would be God the Father, God the Son. Yeah, and so we actually agree with you that before Yeshua came, he would be in the Elohim nature, that spiritual nature, those two, only two natures in all the creation that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. So that Yeshua would be, before he became manifest in the flesh, he would be considered a God because he's Elohim. And I personally put him in, in the place of kingship over all the angels, but underneath his father. And so that he does, yes, Elohim did come to the earth, Emmanuel with us, right? And Elohim mm -hmm. did come to the earth and dethroned his glory and his power and his kingship and be, took okay. on the likeness of a man and a humble mm -hmm. servant. Yeah. Did not think equality be with God, but instead came in and to do his mission. But then once glorified and resurrected, as Hebrews 1 tells us, he's he's God again. He's in that Elohim nature again, that spirit nature again. Um, like he says in John 3, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You know, you have to be a spirit to enter the kingdom of God, right? So this that Hebrews chapter 1, he's placed above the authority of the angels in his high priest position, and he's king of kings and lord of lords, given all authority in heaven and earth. But like 1 Corinthians 15, 27 tells us, all things were put in subjection under his feet except for the Almighty, except for his Father, except for God. And so therefore, I would say we, during all these passages, we'd have to define the contextual use of the word God um, and that's where I would just personally disagree with your interpretation of seeing the angel of the Lord and, and thinking that's and not an angel and just somehow a Christophany, because uh, I don't I feel like there's an importance to the idea of the first coming uh, that was prophesied and announced. Otherwise, in, in your view, uh, respectfully, you have Yeshua showing up everywhere before his first coming. And mm -hmm. then his first coming is not really his first coming. He's been here all the time. Well, no, I, I well, I think the what really demarcates it is that he comes in the flesh. Right, so when he was coming before, he was taking on a humanoid, okay, a very human-looking uh, form, to be clear, because I, we're made in God's image, let's be clear about that, okay, and he must have turned down the lights quite a bit so he didn't blast everybody, but he, but he was not actually of, uh, he was not of the same um, substance as... He wasn't man. Uh, he, wasn't he wasn't man, wasn't man. right? He was not made of dirt. All right. And when he came in the flesh, then he was made of dirt. All right. And his body was at least. Um, but before that, he had a, well, <laughs> a God body, you know, because he's got okay. Right. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. <clears throat> so right. we, now we that agree. he's glorified, is he no, is he no longer a glorified man? He's, he's a now, spiritual it, man. Exactly. It's so no I guess what I'm saying is glorified celestial, man. if you will. You were you were trying to equate his first coming just meaning being manifest in the flesh, but yet he's got a second coming and he's coming back. Yeah. Glorified. Glorified as a as a new creation. There this is the he's the first fruits of the first resurrection, which is a which is a new uh, creation like there's never been a glorified man before you've already had angels they've already got their glory they have eternal bodies but now men get the promise of the resurrection to get their eternal bodies well men started out to get really that. glorified you know exactly adam and Abe I mean, were initially glorified. okay yeah now they, we're getting they started off now good. we're getting somewhere guys <laughs> <laughs> they, they started off so good, you guys obviously went downhill from there right? well, when you say you now we're getting somewhere what do you mean it's like you got a gotcha moment What's yeah no i feel like we're actually starting to understand your position so now you think so are you guys of the belief that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve did not have bodies of flesh, but they had more like a spiritual light body it's before they fell. They well, I, I would say it was made of dirt because God says it made of dirt. <laughs> yeah. But okay. it was dirt that did not have any decay, degeneration, and no decomposition. And so they were actually absorbing God's light, re-emitting God's light, very much in the same way that Moses was glowing when he came down from Mount Sinai. But because he was decaying flesh, that glow started to fade. 
Uh, and I, I detail all this in Corrupting Image Volume 1, if anybody's uh, curious about this. I've got a whole chapter on it. It's quite exciting. Okay. Uh, well, and it's it's based on uh, biophotonics, that DNA mm. uh, absorbs light and it re-emits light. Right? It's pretty cool. I've, I've it, seen your work on that. It's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's seriously cool. Yeah. It, it, you know, God's work, right? You know, so I yeah. just, you know, have been like, oh, that's cool. Right. So, um, so I would say that they had, you know, flesh, skin, but their clothing was light, just as it says in Psalm 104. They were clothed in light. When they sinned, that clothing glow started to fade away. And they're like, oh, gosh, we're kind of naked. Uh oh. And then they tried to cover themselves because they had a covering. Naked is never a good thing in the Bible. Um, you know, you, there was always some kind of covering. And, um, and we're going to have that as well. In the kingdom of my father, uh, you're going to shine like the brightness of the sun, right? We're going to have these glorified, bright bodies just as uh moses and elijah were glowing as well so you know that's our history that's our future uh right now we're stuck kind of dull and not so bright at the moment um so we have that to look forward to so you know we're going to have bodies that yeah will be spiritual but I, I i'm very careful about that word because i think sometimes we think that spiritual just means like a ghost or something but we see in first corinthians chapter 10 that they all uh, ate the same spiritual bread. What did they eat? They ate manna. It was real. It was, you know, stuff you could touch and put in your in your mouth and they chew, chewed on it, right? And they drank from that same spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ, right? So Paul tells us point blank that the rock that was following them, and this is something mm -hmm. that he was getting from the Aramaic Targumim, that there was a rock that was following them, right? And God even said to Moses the first time, hey, I'm going to go and stand in front of the rock and I want you to hit it, right? And yeah. then the second time he says, no, don't hit it. Well, he doesn't say that, but he says, go talk to the rock, right? Go talk to it. And Moses hits it because he's ticked off, right? So he, he kind of blew that. That was Yeshua, right? Point blank, Paul tells us that was Christ. There's well, he to... tells us, yeah, I was gonna say he tell he, you know we know the issue is not literally a rock, and we know that they yeah. didn't drink from the from the angel that followed them. They drank from the rock, the water that came out of the rock that was split, right? Uh, so we know he's he's employing metaphor there to describe. I don't know something. Don't, well, let's let's take right? a look at it. They all passed through the sea. They really went through real sea. They mm -hmm. they ate the spiritual bread. They but Yeshua they wasn't bread. the sea, right? It doesn't say that he was the sea. Right. No, it says that they, they were all the baptized in the sea. They were under the cloud, yeah. right? God was the cloud, right? And God was the cloud. I want to make that very clear. Angel. God literally was a cloud. Okay. So then you're, then, and then God you're was that a the flame Exodus, of fire. He was a pillar of fire. So the Exodus 23 angel that was sent to go with him, you're saying that was a Christophany then? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And the Egyptians okay. thought so too, right? Uh, the Egyptians thought it was a Christophany. Well, they didn't think it was Christophany, but they thought it was Apophis, their arch enemy, and they thought it was. You don't hey. see it, you don't see it in the Bible. This is in uh, ancient Egyptian texts in the tombs of the pharaohs. Okay, like all the tombs of the pharaohs, and I can show you. Can if I you want to can, see it. can I please use Jubilees then, if we're going to use ancient <laughs> texts? No, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that scripture. I'm just <laughs> suggesting that's a, a interesting corroboration. And but, uh, when, when we're done, uh, Doctor <laughs> Hamp, if you have a free time, I'd welcome you to check out my channel uh, specifically. Uh, the Investigating Babylon series, because I go into ancient Egyptology and their relationship to the Hebrews. And so specifically how it plays out in Revelation, you might find it interesting. So we talk about rocks. That's where, again, the word is using metaphors from Genesis to Revelation. We, Yeshua says, I am the bread. We obviously know he's not ground up. We put in an oven and baked. When he says, I am living the living water, we know he's not H2O. When he does say he's the shepherd. Yah calls himself the shepherd. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Ezekiel 34. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I uh, I mean, so there's metaphors. I, I think the rock, well. I think he was actually a rock. I think he yeah, was a shapeshifter. The, the rock didn't accompany them. The rock was it, in the yes, stationary it did. place. It is. Well, what does yes, Paul it say? What okay, does it say? I'm saying he, he's the rock talking that about... accompanied them. <laughs> and the rock was yeah, Christ. I'm, but I'm saying that it says a spiritual rock for one, and yeah. it's not no, literally it's, the water. What does the text say? So they That's didn't your drink. Opinion. What does the text say? They didn't drink from the angel. The text in Exodus tells me they did not drink from the angel. Well, they drank if, from if the I water. Mean, an angel. Rock. If I may, so according to the to the Aramaic Targumim, right? These were, uh, you know, kind of additions. <laughs> okay, well, the, these were the, the I'm definitely going to use Jubilees now. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, He's that, using fine. Paul's I, letters, I, I, John. I, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm, I'm not suggesting that the Targumim are 
of the, of the same caliber. Okay. But, but they're interesting interpretations on the parts of the Jews. Right. But so they, they do form your opinion though. Right. Well, they, it they would be dishonest they to say that they don't, they corroborate my opinion. Okay. So, but they're not scripture. I, well, I, I consider Paul to be scripture. Okay. Yeah. So where in the world is Paul getting this? Now, if you go back to that text, if you would, please, what do we see there? He says that they all ate the same spiritual bread. Do we agree that the spiritual bread that he's talking about is manna? Correct. If you took it that way, because it could be the words of the Lord given through Moses for their instruction and teaching, which wait, is what you refer to. So they, they they went through the, the sea. The yeah. Did they go through the sea? Okay, so they did go through the sea, literally. Yeah, Pat. Pat yeah, verse one. They passed through the sea. They're all baptized okay. in Moses in the cloud in the sea. So we okay. know they didn't get wet through the sea. So they weren't literally baptized. Well, he says they were baptized. So they went through Wall water on both sides. Of allegory, metaphor, drawing conclusions based off of I, typology. I don't know. He's very, he's I, I good at it. Well, I mean, mine might be the minority opinion here. That's that's okay with me. But they really were under a cloud. We're told that God was a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Mm -hmm. yeah. God can so shape Exodus actually, actually does to. say the angel moved. It does. It does 23. say an angel. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You're making my points for me. Thank you so much. But it also says that God was, or yud Vafi was the cloud and the pillar of fire, right? So he can shapeshift if he wants to. And if he wants to show up as a rock, fine with me. He was in, I would con contend that it says he was in the cloud, in the fire. Which no. Is it does. The Hebrew doesn't say that at all. Okay. Well, I'm just going off of all the translations I've seen. Okay. So... Um, our God is a consuming fire, right? I mean, when you see this all over, that God is fire, right? He is and... spirit, too. He is light. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. that's fine. No one has ever well, seen the Father. And, and what is spirit, right? Are, are angels I mean, spirit? you know, yeah, of course they are. Okay, but, so then are angels what is as mighty as God, as, as Yahweh, as the Creator? Well, obviously not. Right, obviously so there's, there's levels to this spiritual makeup, right, of power. Well, we but that. everything comes Despite. out of God. I mean, God is the source of all things, right? right? And if we want to we call that, that spirit, sure, that's fine. So Ver spirit versus enough? dirt. Okay, that's what I would suggest. Spirit versus dirt, mm -hmm. right? We, so, we, could, we can go with that, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and so the, the, the rock that was following them was not made of earth stuff, okay? It wasn't just your garden variety rock. This was a special rock. And the fire that was there, you know, that wasn't your just your average get a lighter, a big lighter, and there you go, you got fire, right? That's why Nadav and Abihu met with a big explosion when they took Eshzara, they took strange fire into the Lord's presence because the two don't mix, right? God's fire is of a very different nature. It's made of God stuff, and I can't tell you what God stuff is because it's God. Um, but I know what, you know, your basic earth fire is. It's made of you know, whatever, you know, plant material, a uh, tree, whatever that burns. Right. And so that's of a different, a different nature. Well, spe speaking of fire, we have the Lapid, the torch that walks through the, the covenant that Yah cut with Abraham. And this is my understanding from studies. Obviously I didn't live back in that time, but when cutting a covenant, when Yah cut a covenant uh, with Abraham, he obviously knew it was a covenant to Abraham and his seed. He knew that the uh, seed, the Israel, the descendants would break that covenant. And it was an unconditional one-sided covenant in which Yah was agreeing that when you break this covenant, I must die in order to restore this covenant. And that's exactly what Yah did. He didn't punt to some lesser created Elohim. He didn't cheat. Yah became in the flesh incarnate and he kept the covenant. He's the one that through his blood renewed the covenant. In other words, when Yeshua was obviously aware of the covenant, he said before there was Abraham, there was I am. It, again, it was Yah that made the covenant. I like, I'm trying my best to avoid things like son and father right now, but it was, it was Yah in the flesh that took on the punishment as a result of that covenant being broken by us. And y'all have him creating a son, an agent, a lesser God, instead of Yah, the almighty, upholding his covenant. And, and you're, you're grinning, Sean, but that's exactly Why? what you're teaching. Well, because, because you're using very, you know, intentionally derogatory terms to, to misrepresent the position. This is what classic, what was intentional? 
Well, it's just the, the lesser right created so, Elohim is what you teach. I'm, I'm going to answer you. I just wish you'd let me. All right. So basically, it, it, there's nowhere in the text. If the text says that Yeshua is not as great as his father, I'm going to believe the text. And that's what we feel the text clearly mm-hmm. says in dozens of places. Um, we do not. I do not see your case, Scott, anywhere in the text that says Yeshua is outside of time and creation and that Yahweh is, is the only one interacting with in, in all these spots where angels are interacting. I don't see your case for that as that. well as. OK, as well as Genesis 15, the, the text literally does not say that that Yahweh walked through the, the paces and made a fire that only he a covenant that only he had to die to repair the covenant. It That's eisegesis. OK, so all I'm, torch. So all I'm trying to say is Jubilees directly tells you an angel was overseeing this encounter. This is a normal altar covenant that, that Abraham built. Abraham was a qualified priest to Yahweh. He knew how to build an altar. He knew how to properly slaughter and put the, the animals on the fire to be burnt. So the angel lit the fire in this moment. This is what Jubilees helps you understand as well. Just like the angel lit the fire with Manoah just like, or, or with Gideon, just like the angel lit the fire in Leviticus 9, just like the angel lit the fire in 1 Kings 8. The angel lit the fire to establish the sacrifice and approve it for for the Father above in heaven. So this is our understanding of these passages. And Jubilees is, does not mince words. Directly tells you that Abraham knew exactly what he was doing. This was no, this was no threshold covenant. He did not put this stuff on the ground. He built an altar of unhewn stone, and he properly slaughtered and placed these things on the altar. And my last question, Scott, I'd have for you in regards to all this would be: Do you feel so? Where is you? Where is if you feel that the Almighty is different from Yodhe Vafe? Is that correct? No, I don't okay. know where you would. Have, I'm sorry, guys. I don't know where still you don't would understand your from. position. Yeah, I don't. Really All right, uh, let me let me here look, guys. And I, I posted this on my Facebook in this short discussion, especially when, when we're having a back and forth like this. Trying to fully explain my understanding is going to be very, very limited. I would recommend your audience, if, if they really wanted to understand sort of where I'm at right now, Michael Oman at Olive Branch Fellowship has a six-part series called Divinity Unveiled, another six- or seven-part series called The Son of God, and a very recent series called The Redemptive Plan or God's Redemptive Plan. Essentially, just to sum it up, yeah, just succinctly. What, what we what we what we know in Scripture and what's revealed to us as the Father would exist. Not the heavens cannot even contain Yah, the Father. So he's in a, the Father would be like in eternity, outside of the space time creation, outside of the heavens because he Yah created the heavens. What we see within this space time creation is Yahweh, but it's not all of Yahweh. It's like Yeshua is an image of Yah. He is not Yah in his full expression in the eternal state. We live in a creation. We are subject to, obviously, rules that Yah set in place and boundaries. And I would say those boundaries are even the created heavens. The Father would exist outside of third heaven. So what, the, what, what Michael teaches in great detail and what I believe is that when Ezekiel, when Isaiah, when Daniel is seeing a vision of Yah, the Most High Elohim, that is not what is referred to as the Father. The Father being outside of space-time and then everything... That's exactly what I just asked. When, like, pardon? That's exactly what I just asked you and you said no. What? No. No, you didn't ask that same question. Okay. Okay. All right. So well, they're having a story. So when Daniel is approaching the ancient of days, and then he's, and then a couple of verses later, he sees the son of man approaching the ancient of days, right? We both, I think, concluded, yes, it sounds like it reads as there's two entities there. That's outside of time and space. Daniel was transported to in this vision no, in, in the spirit no. outside of all creation. He got to go no, where they're sitting on in things. Creation. And... That is in creation. Okay. okay. In other words, so then the ancient of days is not in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. That includes all the heavens. God is above and beyond the heavens. Guys, where does it say that? You th- the heavens can't can't contain him. Yeah, because he's mighty. It's it... a, all the figure. It's an expression. The, the heavens, heavens are created. Him, like. 
Well, yeah, we again, understand there, 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 it's it's not he lives in his creation. Like God is limited he, well, by he his will creation. dwell among us. That's part of the promise of the covenant. He's going to dwell among us, literally. Well, of course. Right? We agree. So he can be contained in his creation, right? Of course. Okay. But he also exists outside of it. Can? That's fine. He, if he wanted to, he could. Yeah, because yeah. he created. He, we get that. All I'm trying to say, we're trying to get you to actually define for us your understanding of, of who. Okay. All right. Father, well, father outside yeah. of time, father within time and space, manifests himself, if you will, in whatever form or likeness he chooses to do so, and he okay. does use messengers and angels and agents, and he chose to honor the covenant that he made okay. with Abraham by becoming flesh and dying to redeem us. That's why Yeshua is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. These are all terms for Yahweh. Oh, okay. So you are directly equating Yahweh to Yeshua, the resurrected Yeshua. Is that correct? Well, Yeshua is Yah. Okay, so then why is Yahweh... Been, okay. That's been pretty clear since the beginning, okay. I hope. Just, thank, <laughs> thank you for helping clarify. The follow-up question would be, <laughs> why then is Yeshua made a priest after his resurrection? And who is he ministering to as his priesthood? Well, uh, why is he the high priest? Well, ultimately, it's it's to fulfill Yom Kippurim. Okay, who's he ministering to? What do you mean, who's he ministering to? The priest can, can I take that? Let me, let me take that. Yeah, yeah, Doug, take that. Okay. Okay. Dr. Hamp, go ahead. Okay, so we got we got to back up just a little bit. So, uh, at Mount Sinai, um, Yehovah entered into a marriage relationship with Israel. Right. right, and he tells us this in Jeremiah thirty-one and thirty-two. Right, the behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, house of Is and Judah, not according to the covenant I made with the house of uh, Israel in those days when I took them out of the land of Egypt. You know, by the hand out of the land of Egypt, uh, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. Right, mm -hmm. so that was this husband wife uh, contract covenant was made at Mount Sinai. All right? Literal. So you're you're taking that literally yes. then? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Of so right. entire right. So love did, story, dude. So Yahweh conjugated with two million people. No, to, to consummate that covenant. No, they did not have sex. <laughs> That's kind of, can't be okay. literal. So then, so then we know it's metaphor, right? We know it's a metaphorical mm -hmm. comparison. No, to his authority over Israel, right? No, they no, entered into a husband. covenant relationship. Do don't, they enter don't into a covenant relationship? Like husband and wife is in humans do do, but you're trying to put God down on our little little terms. Well, We're no, just humans. I, I think God uses our terms to. Of course he does. Father, so he's an things. exact example. Exactly. Okay. All right. So okay. I'm sorry. Right, Dr. So uh, keep going. no, it's okay. Well, uh, as we all know, the marriage didn't go so well. Um, Israel was quite unfaithful, and she became an adulterous wife, which he says a zillion times. Uh, and then we have in Jeremiah chapter three, where he says that I gave the northern kingdom a certificate of divorce. Judah deserved it. Yes. But he made a uh, a promise to David that he would never take away uh, someone. Right. You know, someone from being there. OK, so so Judah gets gets by on a technicality. All right. The, but the, the sister, right? Sorry. No, no. The treacherous sister. Yes. So yeah, Yahweh right. married two two sisters. No, well, Israel it, was well, one. Ken. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, but but that but but that imagery is used. In, imagery. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it does talk about you know that uh, there were two sisters and what Ezekiel. But didn't Yahweh 13. say that Israel was his son? How can they be yes. sisters? And, and, <laughs> and his wife. Yes. Right. Yep. This is messing yep. me up. I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, his father, sorry, sorry. son, husband, yeah, wife. No, wow, it's no. Yahweh. I don't, sorry, I don't want to contain Yahweh. He can do whatever he wants, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. Okay. It, well, it's, it's really but we impossible. do have a we do have a lot of specific language talking about in uh, Hosea chapter one. He says, "I will no longer have mercy in the house of Israel, but I will have mercy in the house of Judah." All right, and it, we're told there that um, that. The days are coming when I'll make, uh, you know, he's going to bring them all back together, right? And then in chapter two, he says he's going to make, he, well, he says he's going to uh, betroth her to himself forever in righteousness, right? So the whole betrothal idea is the idea of the wife, right? And um, and so how does this happen? How can God have made a marriage covenant, which he says very point blank, that um you know, I gave her a certificate of divorce. We had a marriage contract. She's an adulterous wife. 
I'm divorcing her. I'm no longer her God. She's no longer my people. And then he says, but I'm going to, I'm going to betroth you to me. Now, Deuteronomy 24 says, can't do that. If a man has a wife and he finds some ervat devar, some unclean thing in her, and he sends her out of his house, gives her a certificate of divorce and sends her out of his house. And then she becomes the next guy's wife. And then that doesn't work out. She cannot go back to the first husband. That would greatly pollute the land. All right. But God says, hey, but, but come on back. I'm going to bring you back. So how does he not break his own rule and resolve this? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter seven, and he's speaking to those who know the law, that um, if the husband dies, then she is freed from the law of the husband. Right. So Jesus is the husband. He dies to cancel all of the stipulations and debts and obligations and penalties and fees that went along with adultery. Because if you're married to God, um, your husband's never going to die. Right. So you're always going to be considered an adulteress. But it just so happened that, that God came in the flesh. He then went to the cross. He died. And the old covenant the marriage contract died with him right and uh so paul says so then if while her husband lives she marries another man she'll be called an adulteress but if her husband dies she's free from the that law the law of her husband so that she is no adulteress though she's married another man therefore my brethren you also become dead to the law the law of the husband through the body of christ so you may be married to another to him who was raised from the dead but the one that died and the one that rose are the same person, but legally they're, they're two legal entities. you got Jesus who died as the husband of the first covenant, of the Sinaitic Mosaic covenant. And then you have the Jesus who rose and he then established the new covenant in his own blood, right? So back to Scott's point in Genesis chapter 15, when, when God, as the lapid, as the flame and the burning torch, the tanur, uh, when he passed through, again, God can be a shapeshifter. We see that. It's not a problem for God. Um, he passed through. He made this uh, suzerain vassal um, contract, which was very much a something in the ancient world. So I don't look at the Book of Jubilees. That was a much, much later book that did not understand. But um, this uh, suzerain vassal covenant was something that was done in the ancient world. They would take the uh, bodies of animals, they would, you know, cut them up, and the blood would then flow through, and then both parties would pass through. And what they were saying is, look, if I break my side of this agreement, may this and more so happen to me, All right? So both parties are supposed to pass through. But in this case, God pulled a fast one, and he's like, uh, go to sleep, Abram. And so only God passed through. So this became, instead of a bilateral agreement, it became a unilateral. So only God is on the hook. Only God can be uh, responsible if, if something goes wrong. And well, it just so happened that it did because, you know, Israel didn't keep their, their end of this whole thing. And so God died. God, that's can what God is saying. Okay. Can we concede yeah. that the Susan Vassal interpretation of Genesis 15 is a outside of scripture eisegetical interpretation it's not eisegetical it's called his it's history okay okay so when well, you study history I, then you know this is what <laughs> what was okay. happening right so and so this you, wasn't this wasn't done in a in a vacuum right this whole okay. idea was something that abraham and the ancient people were familiar with all right, right but there's we got several different i would take several different issues with that um but the first one that still goes back to my main point which is if you believe that God died to restore that covenant, mm -hmm. why is he a why is he a mediator, and who's he mediating to? What does Romans eight say about the Spirit mediating on our behalf or praying to our half to the Spirit? Okay, I'm asking specifically about the role of the resurrected Yeshua being called a high priest eternally, forever. Okay, according to what order? Melchizedek. So, uh, okay, so Doctor Hampton, what's, the difference, what's the difference between the Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood? There's a difference in qualification. One's not based on genealogy. One's based on eternal life. So I'm asking specifically, since we know our resurrected Yeshua has eternal life, and now he's in the Melchizedek order, ministering as a priest in the heavenly temple, Hebrews 8, 1 through 2, who is he ministering to on our behalf? Well, well, he took his blood once for all, right? Exactly. It's not so, continuing celestial cow sacrifices. In he he took a bowl of his blood up to outside. Is of that, are you guys saying that? He literally... Well, he says that he took his own blood. 
So in Acts chapter he one, he ascended to the Father with, as the first fruits. Uh, well, let's go to okay, here. I'm just asking. I mean, I'm just asking practically. Like, who, if why is he called a priest forever? If his only work was to die on the cross. Well, well he's it, firstborn. He's not just priest. He's firstborn. He's I'm asking king. specifically about the. the I understand many times. you are, but the order of Melchizedek is three different roles. Sean, it's king, priest, and firstborn. It's not just priest. The, okay, so this this the order got is, divided we're, we're, up. We can't, we're not denying that we're, Yeshua is a king and. Our first we're not, first we're not going to just glaze oh, over no. the, the priest part, though. Yeah. This is why I'm asking a specific question. He was prophesied to become a priest in Psalm okay. 10, 1 through 4. Okay. Mm -hmm. did, his said, death, he, did his death atone for our sins once and for all? Yes, but there's a process how that works through a priesthood. And this is why he's called a priest forever. So I'm asking from you gentlemen's perspective, why is Yeshua called a priest forever if his final work was only to just die on the cross because he's that he, good as the lamb <laughs> as the lamb john as the lamb yeah, his yeah. blood yeah. was sufficient once and for all it is sufficient he is Does, not in, okay he, let me let me finish please it, he is not in the heavens right now offering up spiritual cows as sacrifices or 70 bulls on on feast of tabernacles if if i'm incorrect that you teach that please correct me now so where is he? Where is he? What's he doing? Because I see this right here. I see him in a temple in heaven ministering. Exactly. What does it say that he's offering up sacrifices and killing celestial cows? Let's do little by little if we can. Okay? Yes or no? So I'm, first, first three. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. You never answer, Sean. Here's a direct answer. Hebrews 9.23, better, better spiritual sacrifices than the ones in the earthly tabernacle. Spiritual. I'm not, asking, I'm not asking that right now. Please give me a minute. I'm specifically asking, why is he called a priest? If he's not doing priestly duties in a temple, when he's called a priest ministering in heaven's temple. So wait, wait a second. So how often did the high priest have to go into the Holy of Holies? Once, Once a, year. a year. Why not every day? Well, that's not what the law prescribed. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. The and Lord. so that meant that the Yom Kippur sacrifice was good for how long? One year. Well. They also did oh, yeah. daily atonement sacrifices, morning and evening. Also, that, that is on the feast I, days, they did Sabbaths. They I, did so atonements. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not denying that. But as far as the the covering, the day of covering, right, Yom Kippur, okay. that that sacrifice, mm -hmm. which was for all kinds of sins, that was like the everything catch all. You know, we screwed up, it, and let's throw was. in the stuff we forgot to. Um, it was. You know, and I celebrate this every year. We go through all the dumb things that we've done, <laughs> right? Yeah. And um, and and so this is the ultimate sacrifice. So, mm -hmm. um, so that had a shelf life of one year. Okay, well that's interesting. Well, in Jesus' case, when he offered his own blood, not the blood of bulls and calves, but his own blood mm -hmm. in the temple, not made of hands, that is not of his creation, but he offered it in that same place where Isaiah said. Oy vavoy, I'm in big trouble, you know, because I've just I've now seen the the living God. That's where Jesus took His blood once for all, all right? Can, and that's what it says in Hebrews chapter nine, right? Well, so you know He He did that once, right? He doesn't have to do it again because His blood, one time ministered, took care of everything that the animal sacrifices had to be done on a regular basis. His blood did it once and for all. Is the law abided by in heaven, the law that he gave for us to, to abide by on the earth, pertaining to the Levitical sacrifices law? and atonement? You mean like uh, the Levitical which, which law? law? Like, yeah. Is the kingdom of heaven keep the law of God pertaining to temples and the priests? Levitical law is my question. It's not it's not Levite's law, brother. It's Yahweh's law. I, I okay, I understand that, but but yeah, the, so Yahweh gave certain, a law. Okay. And again, we're talking about Mosaic law. Which again, okay. right now we don't again, have we're talking about Yahweh's law. I would say yes. Let's just go with yes. Okay. okay. So in the You're kingdom of heaven, is there, is, there's a temple, right? Do we acknowledge that there's a temple in the kingdom of heaven? For now, yes. For now? Yeah. There won't be in uh, the New Jerusalem eventually. Oh, the, 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 Naos, the Naos thing, Sean. Oh, the Naos. The shrine. Okay. So um, we'll go, right, we mean, can go to that in a minute. But well, there is no, there, a, there, there is, is a Naos right now, right? There's a there's, there's no holy of holies in the new, in the New Jerusalem, but there is a temple. Well, we're told that there. Well, the 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 visions that we get of it seem to be the holy. I mean, what's inside the holy holies? God, right? 
Exactly. That's so, why in Revelation yeah. 21, 22, yeah. it tells you there yeah. is no naos, there is no holy of holies, yeah. but yeah. there is a, the Father, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its naos, are its holy of holies, because there's no empty shrine room. There, There's, it, within the interior of the temple where the yeah. empty holy of holies was, it's now filled with the Almighty and the Lamb. So there, well, there is Well, I mean, a naos can just be temple. It doesn't always have to be the specifically the... Holy yeah, of holies. It can, but contextually, that's why we get to that, because Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 to 48, describe in great detail the millennial right. temple. I agree. Yeah, so, okay. I agree with you. And it, it describes that the law of God is being carried out in a temple right. in the same way it's being described and carried out to in the days of, of Moses. I would say yeah. even before then, all the way back to yeah. the Melchizedek, I mean, you've got plenty of examples of a priest doing the laws of God and ministering, Abraham, yeah. Genesis 26, yeah. 5. Mm -hmm. So, Therefore, if Yeshua is made a priest forever, what's he doing yeah. up there? He well, he he did the the priest thing that he had to do once. His blood okay. is that good. I, he doesn't I've have heard to that. like. He doesn't have to <laughs> reapply it. I mean, are you suggesting he has to reapply it? What do you you tell okay, me? Okay, real, real, hey, hey, real quick. His theory, Scott, Doug, Scott, his theory quick. is it's it's really good, man. You know, you're real quick, real quick, guys. Listen, <laughs> okay. look, I've I grew up in. I went to Bible college. I've listened to both you, Doctor Hamp, and other people all my life. I, I'm a word nerd. I, I consume it daily for forty. You know, since I was seventeen. So we're, I'm going okay. on quite a few years now. Okay. And I've I've heard the idea of penal substitutionary atonement. I've heard the idea of Yeshua's <laughs> blood being used to atone for our sins. I agree with that verbiage and that language. I agree with the general premise of what it does for us. Okay. I do not denigrate. I do not lessen his work and sacrifice on the cross. I simply am asking if he is ordained to be a priest and prophesied to be a priest before he even came. Yeah. Spilling his blood on a, on a cross outside the temple on, at the hands of his betrayers and their, and their oppressors is not the qualification for how atonement is made through the law of God. It is spoken Whoa. of as the vehicle that gets you to his priesthood at his resurrection. So according to this traditional interpretation of saying, well, his blood just atones for us, and I don't have to, I get to ignore all these words in the New Testament about him being a priest, I would suggest it, it, he didn't have to become a priest at all if simply he needed just to die and resurrect. If that was all it, it but now he's been ordained as a priest forever. And Hebrews yeah. 5 directly tells us this. So Can Hebrews 5 directly. Uh, I'm almost done real quick. I just okay. get this out so that you guys can understand where I'm coming from. I, Hebrews I do, 5. I just... Okay, go, well, maybe Dr. Hamp hasn't, so I'm going to explain to him real quick. Please. So basically, we are told right here, during the days of Jesus' earthly life, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Well, we know he died the first death, but he's not safe. He's saved from the second death. He doesn't have to be destroyed in the lake of fire. He was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Having been made perfect, that's the resurrection, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He calls our names out on the day of the Lord, Revelation 3, 5, and raises from the dead. And it was designated by God as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So he's, he's a priest that has a job function. And this is what I just, I've tried to talk to so many pastors about this and everyone's ignoring the definitions of these plain, plainly written words. So where does it say that, job. but where does it say that the a priest in the order of Melchizedek has to do it on a regular basis? Where does it, where would it say that suddenly the law of God changes and he doesn't? Well, that's it's, it's not changing. Well, it's not so, changing. So answer his question, please, Sean. I mean, I did. He asked you a that is, question. It's a Jewish it way of answering, but I did. But where right? does like, it where, say that? It's a, it's a, where does it say that the law of God changed and a priest doesn't minister in the temple according to the law of God? He did minister. Where? How? But just like just like the high priest had to offer once a year, okay. Jesus had to do it once in eternity, right? So the high priest never had to offer his own blood. He was always well, the Jesus came as the lamb. lamb. I get it. Well, He's also I mean, called himself a bread loaf, and he also called himself the light of life and the truth. And we know that these are descriptive terms about his obedience and his purity. And they're all true. And his, so and does Yahweh, true. We love it and law, it. Uh, Dr. Ham, does Yahweh in his law ever accept a human sacrifice, human blood? Well, he gave his own blood. That's the point. He gave That's himself. the point we're making. God so did not say, here, a bigger God switch God himself, not he a man. Himself. He, so that, well, that would make him the ultimate hypocrite, then, in my opinion. Why is that? He gave his own blood. Yeah. Exactly. After he after he poo pooed human sacrifice, blood on altars from the pagan nations, never wanted Israel involved in doing anything well, like that. But he himself gives his own blood. Like that to me yeah. is the ultimate like, blue, double standard there. Well, look, uh, look, but, if uh, if uh, 
you know, someone's, someone's kidnapped my kids. And, and I said, look, I'll, I'll give you a Scott in exchange for them. That would be very nice of me to do that. Right. But, okay. but if I gave myself, uh, right. I mean, if I went and I fought and I was willing to give up my own life, that's my choice. Right. Versus me giving sure. up Scott is, is not my right to do but, that. But to Sean's right? point, there's, there's, there's a system, a process involved with the actual physical ability to atone. Right. And it never involves uh, well, human atone blood. Just means God God blood. For all. Right. I just want to say this again, because every time this word seems to come up, everyone talks together and the audience can't hear it. Mm -hmm. Yahweh's law never calls for or prescribes human blood to make atonement. I want because people are spiraling in the live chat as well, guys. Just listen very carefully. If we're st if we're preaching the Torah, yeah. his law does not accept human blood anywhere near his altar or temple. This is why the whole we have the uncleanliness laws in Leviticus 13 through 15. You cannot even have blood on you. The, the priests had to be checked thoroughly. The people bringing forth the sacrifice just to the outer gate had to be checked thoroughly. I'm, you cannot really put human blood yeah. on the altar. What are, doesn't, what are you Jesus, doesn't Hebrews, what one sec, doesn't Hebrews say that he offered his own blood? I'll, I'll yes. show it here. Through we, the sacrificial, right? The, the metaphor of him sacrificing. A metaphor. On, uh, well, no, I mean, was, right, was he right chopped up on an altar? It's 912. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he blood. entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. What, okay, so this I, is I'm why not we asked sure why we're debating this. I mean, this I, is why we asked earlier is yeah. that when he walked into heaven, glorified yeah. and resurrected. Okay. Even though, even though. <clears throat> Uh, Paul in First Corinthians well, fifteen fifty. He, he may says have done this when he was dead, but I don't know. That's another. I don't. I. I don't Whoa, know. I don't know when, wait, what? Well, never. Never mind. Never. Mind, never mind. I, okay. I retract, so in first I in First Corinthians fifteen, Paul tells us flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So you're saying that when Shua resurrected and glorified in his brand new body, mm -hmm. walked into heaven's temple, which is what two chapters before chapter ten, it okay. says that he is in the the true temple, the one that the one on the ground was patterned after. Mm -hmm. He is in a true sanctuary. So when he walked in there, you're saying he brought with him his actual spilt blood from the cross to present it to the Father? What well, does the text what, say? That's what chapter 9 says. It does. What are you, why, are you de, why, are you de, why are you denying that? You're denying because what this right it here. plainly says. Hey, Sean, are you denying so, that right, it's Because of this right here? Can I look? I just like no, I'm not. I'm, I'm asking, I'm trying to read the scriptures. No, I'm not. I'm trying to read the scriptures on screen for us. It's necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly yeah. things themselves with better sacrifices yeah. than these. Exactly. Jesus is the better. He himself he, entered so, heaven. Wait, right? so now it's multiples. Now he had to die multiple times because it no. says sacrifices once and for all. I, I think you're confusing yourself, quite frankly, Sean. Not, um, no, no, no. Go, go to chapter Listen, 9, it, verse 12. I mean, I just don't think it get any it's, it's plainer than that. Too in, it's too in-depth. I think we got into the weeds with this one. But I, well, I'm I think it's really important because it sounds I haven't like seen anything, guys... I haven't seen anything from you, especially, um, Brother Scott. That well, would, I haven't been able to that talk that would, this that would make me want to take your position that Yeshua is. Okay, let, me, let me talk on this real quick. I think you guys are conflating and looking at the Levitical system in which the high priest would enter once a year and he would have to make a sacrifice from animals with his blood. And then he would make a sacrifice for the nation of Israel. Well, Yeshua being the, 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 the spotless lamb, no sin, was able to do this one time. And he is not okay. a Levitical high priest. He is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Eddie Chumney has an excellent teaching on this issue as far as explaining that the order of Melchizedek up until Israel, uh, like Jacob would have been a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. What we get as a, at Sinai when the golden calf incident is then we have this, this order of three. Levite gets the priesthood. Judah receives the royal blessing, the kingly blessing. And then Ephraim receives the firstborn blessing. Now, in Yeshua, with his sacrifice, that is now restored again. In other words, Ephraim, his firstborn, is now back in covenant, no longer divorced as a, as a Scott, nation, not individuals. Scott, we've moved you didn't have, so far, you, You're not letting me finish. The, the Yeshua at, from the tribe of Judah is the king, and he also is the high priest. But it does not mean that he needs to continue to offer sacrifices pursuant to the Levitical system 
that was instituted after the golden calf okay. incident. Uh, it well, was a one time and either. done. It was a one time and done sacrifice. Okay. So, you, thank you for your, for your opinion. I appreciate it. I'm not done yet. Just... Let me finish. And then okay. he will fulfill young, young Kippurim after he returns. He will then have the separate the sheep and the goats. That's when what the, 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 the Moedim or the Moed of Yom Kippur will be fulfilled at that time. I appreciate that. So the little local law did not institute sacrifices. They were done well before all the way did back say to they did. You just did. Also, Yeshua, I'm going back to my basic question. Yeshua, why is he called a high priest if he's not doing priestly duties? What's he doing? What deserves that title? I, can anyone, can, if you don't know, just say you don't know. It's fine. I'm just I, asking. No, I, I, I answered it. You just don't okay. like the answer. What was the answer again? Well, I'm it sorry. was one time, right? He did it. Yes. So you know, he, he, doesn't, he put the robe on and the, the garb. And you know, no. He saved the robe once. He doesn't have to do it again. And then he disrobed. And now okay, he's but but we're having that. a disconnect because you're not describing a priestly duty. You're not, we're not following the definition of it the was a one time. No, you're, duty. you're inventing what. No, I'm not. We, yes, yes, you are. are. Exodus you're, 28 you're tells us what a priest of Yahweh does. So he was a high priest for what, one day? No. He was, well, he's the eternal high priest. Okay. So if he's an eternal high priest. So what do you, so what's the alternative? Applies What's the alternative? He's not doing anything? He's doing Jesus priestly is, duties. So he's, he's a priest. So what's he doing? He's okay. So doing why is it such a scary thing to say that Yahweh Yeshua is preparing a meal for his father? Because that's all sacrifices were. They're preparing no. meals to, to make atonement okay. and reconciliation. Well, uh, what is atonement? Atonement's covering. Why do you need a covering? Mm -hmm. For your sin. And at the resurrection, our sins removed. We get new bodies, new hearts, never sin again. But for now, first so what's 8, wrong 9, with the blood of Jesus of to cover you for your sins? The blood so, of Jesus qualified so. him for the priesthood that was prophesied of him. It so was not. He he was, what is he's he prophesied doing, to be John? a priest forever. He's doing right. the I'm law really... of God. In what is he doing? <laughs> what is in he's... the heavenlies right now as our high priest? What do you believe Jesus is doing for us? He's well, doing because... exactly what this verse tells us. This verse tells us right here. Okay, which one? Right here. It's the point of what we're saying is this: we do have a high priest. Which one? Sat down what at the is right he hand. doing? Right. Let me finish. I'm going to go so, ahead and answer. Thank you. One sec. How many years after Yeshua ascended, carried his bowl into the tabernacle, dumped it, whatever, of blood? How many years after that happened was this letter written? Hebrews. What's, what's the tense of this? It most, sounds, most, it sounds most like people, most scholars believe it was written in the in the sixties. Right. So about maybe about thirty years after Yeshua ascended, right? So did he yeah. delay this bowl emptying of his blood for about thirty years? Well, or of course not, dude. This is written past tense. Right. Well, this is written present tense in well, present tense. let's say 68. Speaking of what he did in the right? past, yes. He had already done this. <laughs> no, okay. it says that's what he's doing. That's of 30 course. years of earth years of what he's doing there, right? Let me get, Sean, I'm going to ask you, what, is, what do you believe in, Ken? Maybe Ken right here. Right here. What Ministers. do you believe Jesus is doing right now in this high priestly role? You know what Aaron did? I'm, I'm going to answer you right here. He does exactly what's prescribed in the law of God as a priest ministering in a temple. He's bringing forward meals to the Father, according okay. to their context yes. of, of definition. I thought God was yes. never hungry. Okay, sacrifices is when you bring forth food that's prepared according to an ingredient on a specific that's, altar. That's pretty a pagan. With a specific pre what? what? That's pretty it pagan is. to suggest that God needs about? meals. God said he's not hungry. So wait He's a minute. Like, All right, hang on. Okay, I hear you. Hang on, and let me go. Let me go here. Then, if that's if that's the claim and that's the accusation, is that somehow his law is pagan? Let's go. No, no, no. I didn't. No, I did not say God's law is pagan. What? Did, why is the father preparing a meal for his son and the and the, the people invited no. to the banquet? <laughs> he slaughters the fattened oxen and the calf. Okay, this is a parable. All right, go ahead. So we're dismissing the, we're dismissing the wedding supper of the lamb as a parable. Well, but you just you don't think we're going to get married to Yeshua. Correct? No. Well, look, the people getting no, married. No, no, here, that, I'm correct. That, that correct. breaks his law because he's a man and so am I. The, the people getting married here, are the servants are the guests, the, the guests that are invited, but the son is the yeah. one that's actually getting married to something, and it's not the people that are the guests. You, you believe it's just New Jerusalem. He's so, marrying a city. Correct? I believe Revelation 21, 9 and 10 directly tells us it's New Jerusalem. Okay. And there's no mincing words about it. Well, we're, we're definitely, we're far off from our original topic. I have to say. Well, it, it, it actually <laughs> relates. When I, when I was asking... <laughs> 
we got to this point because I asked how, you know, what do you believe Yeshua as a resurrected man? If he is Yahweh, what is he ministering to and why is, is the language talking about him like that? Well, and you so, went back to Genesis 15, to the marriage yeah. covenant at Sinai, to the Jeremiah 38 and Isaiah 50 divorce language, and then mm -hmm. tying that into the marriage idea. So that's how okay. we got here. And if okay. we're looking at the marriage supper of the lamb and yeah. we're trying to figure out, is this stuff literal or not? I guess this really boils down to the big question, gentlemen. Do you guys believe heaven is a literal, actual place? Heaven? Do you believe the kingdom of yeah. heaven is a literal yeah, physical created. place? Yes. It's coming to earth in the near future. And will the physical or the tangible? <laughs> yeah. Is I mean, New York City just a bunch of buildings and roads or is, or is it also its people? Oy vey. Is it? Guys, I think you know what I'm asking, right? Is it? Is no, it, no, no. I agree with you that New Jerusalem mountains? is the bride, Sean. But if we look back in, I, I think it's I didn't ask that. I'm just asking. Let me, let me finish. What? Let me finish. If you look back in Ezekiel 23, uh, we are going to see this metaphor used where it's talking about the people because Jerusalem as a brick and mortar city, as Rhodes, did not sin against Yah. Samaria as brick and mortar Rhodes and as a city of buildings did not sin against Yah. The new Jerusalem is no doubt going to be something glorious, but within the new Jerusalem will be the people the bride, if you will, the overcomers. And this is, you know, we didn't really finish up on the high priest issue. This is what I see most problematic about what you're teaching, because I do think that you really, really, really discount what Yeshua did for us as the Lamb of God and what his blood did for us. You this believe, I think you believe that he is still having to offer celestial heavenly Scott. cows up Scott. in the heavens. Is Scott, Yahweh called his law holy and righteous and good. And you're telling me our holy, righteous, and good Messiah now doesn't do what's holy and righteous and good. Of course and not. That's literally what was prophesied no. for him to do. You have no. him under the Levitical priesthood, dude. He's under no, a no, different no, I order. I do not. We've, we've so, already acknowledged that he's in the Melchizedek order. And we've already seen that Melchizedek's do sacrifices as well. We've already so, seen go, that. No, yeah. say, go ahead. If you would, if you pull up my uh, my screen there. So okay. Psalm 50 tells us, uh, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. So he's not he's not hungry. That's what okay. pagan gods do is you prepare a meal and you take it in. You can go to India. But and you guys you have already argued tonight that he ate in Genesis 18. But... But You've argued look, that directly tonight that he ate. I, no, 18. but you're look, come on, you're conflating things. Be honest here. You're conflating. Yes, you are. You're conflating that sacrifices are because God's hungry and these are meals prepared. I didn't for say God. it was because it's hungry. I'm saying that's literally what they are. It's bringing food in a prepared manner with ingredients, of spices, and oil, and drink, and bread, the, the flour offerings, the drink offerings. No, you, God, this is well, they're, they set and ate of the pre in Numbers 18, they set and ate of the sin offering. This is why Moses is asking Aaron in, in Leviticus 10 17, why didn't you eat the sin offering? This was this was something that was prepared okay. as a meal. So, what's your bottom offering. line? What's your bottom line? The, the bottom line is heaven is real. Well, well I think heaven is real, real too. Even if we are, I'm, I'm saying, but what's that the heaven, point here? Yeah. When you when resurrected Yeshua appeared inside of a locked room with the closed doors, and they didn't know how he got in there, and they were startled, and they thought he was a yeah. spirit, but he's like, "No, it's me. Check, tech, touch me, check me out." And yeah. he ate food in front of them, and he said, "Does okay. anyone have any food?" Yeah. So our resurrected, glorified Lord and God Yeshua ate yeah. food in front of them. He wanted it. He's going to eat it. We're told that Passover in Jeremiah 31, 38 is a, is a wonderful, beautiful meal prepared for Israel that we eat inside the kingdom after the resurrection. So this is, I mean, Yeshua himself in, in Luke 22, but, he says, I, I long to, to eat this again with you in the, in the yeah. kingdom. Well, no one's denying that with, he can with eat. With our father. Right? God with, can eat. With, Jesus can eat. With the no father. Problem. And we, I don't think Jesus yeah. needs to eat. Sure. Of course. We I don't, don't think we're going to need to eat because, technically, you know, a mortal, right? You would assume... Right. Yeah. That you don't need to have sustenance in order to continue living. Right. But that's kind of I like eating. Do you, Doug? Sure. I love it. All right. Sure. So I think I think they do too. Even though they don't have I to. Agree. I agree. So what, yeah. what Yahweh's saying in that passage you just pulled up isn't it's not it's the same thing, like can the heavens contain me? But yet he does have a body. I agree. Do I need to eat? The no, father no. does it. The father's but he, spirit. But he likes to. He 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 actually likes yeah. the sacrifice. The smoke comes up. He smells it. Oh, that's. Great. I agree with that. But right. you're you're suggesting that Jesus' blood 
was not sufficient. I okay. didn't. I didn't. I didn't say that. Well, man. you're into the, the blood earns, awfully strongly. So what does his, his blood <laughs> represent? Can, okay. I need, what I is his blood? We, is his blood, man? Can, and, can we and have it's, a can, can we have a, a, a non accusatorial smart, paced, and patient conversation real quick about this without the? I don't even know what just, that means. <laughs> yeah. Can we just Being be patiently? Honest. I'm willing. Walk through, walk I, through I believe this. you, buddy. Yeah, can we just walk Jen, through this? That's not necessary. <laughs> hey, come on. Re okay, I want to. Please don't make me mute everybody. I'm just trying to get this out because I don't want to hold any anger towards any of my guests. But when my guests accuse me of something that I clearly have exegeted through scripture, I don't believe in my heart, it's hard not to get a little roughed, right? Well, so I'm trying to say, stop for a minute, Scott, please. I'm trying. The, the blood of the, the Yeshua clearly makes atonement for us, right? Because we know that's a descriptive phrase about his purity, his obedience. His the, Yahweh does not accept human blood for anything in his law. You cannot eat it. Yahweh doesn't accept it on his altar. He told mankind not to eat it or consume it. It is not used for any form of propitiation ever in his law. But we understand the blood of a lamb that's offered to Yahweh has to be to me, it has to be spotless and blameless. That metaphor is carried over into our Messiah's wonderful, spotless, blameless behavior. He was perfectly walking out the Torah. He's also called our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. We understand these metaphors apply to him. Yes, by his blood, we he secured eternal redemption for us because by his purity and behavior, that allowed him, like Hebrews 5, 7 through 10 says, through his obedience, he was given this priesthood. This is why he came to do the Father's will and glorify the Father and do what was sent of him, which was prophesied to become a high priest. So by his blood, yes, by his purity, he can enter into, that's why Hebrews 9 juxtaposes the Leviticals who were full of sin and frail and weakness and had to offer for their own sin first before they could enter in and minister for the people. Yeshua doesn't have to do that because by his blood, by his purity and obedience, he's never sinned. So he can walk right in. He doesn't need those those bulls to mediate for his own sin and for his family first. He can walk right in and start ministering for collective Israel as a mm -hmm. whole, which is what a priest does. It, that's all I'm saying. Yep. It's not. It's actually glorifying the actual stated prophet's words of why Yeshua was sent. It's actually, in my opinion, kind of a denigration to say he's not a priest when it's directly the, the scriptures say he is. We're not saying he's not a priest. I don't accuse either. either anyone that says, you know what, I don't understand the priesthood of Jesus. Well, you've emphatically well, I mean, Scott, said tonight you mock, he's not doing us. his job. Like, no, you, I have never you, said You've he's mocked us already a several times. Priest. I have never said that. That's where he is right now, according to Order Melchizedek, king, priest, firstborn. He restored that back to Israel. It's amazing, right? He's a ruler of firstborn. He's a king. He's going to rule over the nations. Those are physical, literal jobs, right? Savior, Redeemer, Kinsman, Redeemer, yeah. which he had to become physical, flesh. literal jobs. Sean, he had to become flesh in order to be our Kinsman <laughs> Redeemer. Is he still a physical, literal high priest as well? Physical? He's in a celestial body. So he has a spiritual, resurrected body, and Correct. is his job title a literal job title? Just like his kingship is a literal job title. To high priest. The nations. King, although so right now obviously do? he's not reigning on the earth for right. a new. Jerusalem. So we know that that there's a time period for that, yeah. But there's right. still a time period for his priesthood too, which we believe is actively currently doing right now. Again, the do y'all believe? I've asked it a few times. Do y'all believe that Yeshua in this role is offering up and you know, cows and bulls and goats to? We believe father? in heaven. We believe in the tangible no, no. creation. Yes, there's things okay. up there that so we have on the earth. So, yeah. No. Where do you, you must happening? get that from Jubilees or somewhere. No, I get no. it directly from 1 Timothy 2 5. For there is one God and one mediator, that's a priest, between man and God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So it's and an I, active actually, role, present tense. Yeah. And Sean um, and Doug, what we were talking about before with First Enoch, I know you like the book, you've pulled from it, right? So to, to be fair with me, sure. the angels are referred to as priests too in that book. They do priestly duties in heaven yeah. in that book. I know people want to knee jerk and say, "No, no, no! Jesus is the only only priest who no." They did priestly duties. Well, I, I think I think originally uh, Satan was created as a priest, I and mean, we see that he has the uh, in the Septuagint he's got the twelve stones on him. So it wasn't only a priest had many duties. It wasn't only mm -hmm. about taking blood sacrifices. It was uh, education, right? It was teaching the Torah. It was the a mediator. Doesn't only have to do blood stuff, right? You know, if I 
if um, well, Scott's a lawyer. He he's probably you know done uh, divorce cases right here, sort of mediating between the two parties, right? I mean, so there's lots of types of mediation. Um, when we think of law, sure. there you know somebody who's trying to somehow connect, be a bridge between uh, two different people groups, right? And so what's the, what's the what, one sec? So why does why can't we just go directly to the Father? Because God is fire. God is made of fire. And the last time I got too close to fire, it really hurt. And so I need somebody yeah. to go between me yeah. and the fire. It's a sure. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Okay. So at the and, resurrection, and I believe we when... see that in the, in the, in what, in Jacob's ladder. And when she was said from now on, you, I mean, he's, re he's referring back to uh, Jacob's ladder where Jacob's uh, slept on the stone. He then anointed the stone. Um, you see the you see the the two women that anoint Yeshua. He's the cornerstone. He's also the capstone. We see all this imagery in which what Yah calls Yah in in the Hebrew scriptures, Yeshua uh, says the same exact terminology. Whether it be rock, we now know that if Paul, unless Paul is incorrect, Yeshua is definitely there at the Exodus at, at Exodus as the rock. Uh, and we're not even which, which you yourself said wasn't literal, right? No, I did not say that. Well, I, I said Doug, Yeshua, Doug it was literal. You didn't, right? Paul said Yeshua is the rock, but was, is he a literal yeah. rock right now? No. Was he then? Well, Paul seems to say so. Do you believe that? Okay. Yeah, I, I believe what the scripture yeah. says, dude. I'm the one trying to, I mean, not the one, but I'm looking at the text. Yah made the covenant with Abraham. It doesn't say uh, angel. I mean, for instance, like in Zechariah, it's Yah talking and it says, and they will look to me whom they pierced in Hosea five, in Hosea five and then six. It's Yah talking. He says, I will go. Yah says, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. He doesn't say the messenger of Yah. He doesn't say an agent. He doesn't say a lesser created Elohim will do these things. And so. Again, yeah. yeah, and he will put his feet on the mud. God will yeah. do these things. Yeah, I don't think the text needs to say every single time that it's the angel of the Lord. Or I mean, a lot of times when it says that the word of the Lord came, in my opinion, so you just make it up then? No, Seriously, it, it, the precedent's there already. We know that Yahweh can't actually show up, as Doug said. He's fire. He's quite mighty. You destroy us, so he sends his ministers, and I think a lot of people miss that, like. In Isaiah, for instance, the word of the Lord came to me, the word of the Lord came to me, but there was an angel before that introduced way chapters earlier. Let's not forget. So Yah so can't interact think... with his creation except through mediators. I think he did saying. actually physically at the Exodus on Mount Sinai. I think they heard his literal voice. It was too powerful. They said, quiet. It's too, we're going to die if we continue hearing it. Moses had to get in between and say, okay, I'll, I'll relay the rest of the message who, to you guys. Who did I think he's tried, but he's too powerful. Who did the 70 elders see? The text says they saw Yah. That's the Masoretic text. The, Septu the Septuagint, Septuagint actually says that Moses, Not just Aaron, the Septuagint. well, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 yeah. elders went up and saw the place where God stood. Not that yeah. they saw They saw God. his feet. They saw his right. I, believe they, I believe they can see feet, I, just as Moses saw the back. And this so, is where I was hearkening to Y'all believe earlier. Yah, the invisible God, literally has a He's right not invisible. Hand. That's what it, I'm saying. Paul he's, says he is. He, he can't be seen because he's too mighty. So he cloaks himself in parts of his creation. Fire, cloud, smoke. Sun. He dwells within messenger. it so that no one can see his face because he knows if he removes it, they're dead. So that's how he cloaks himself. That's how he operates. Well, that's how he's Paul, operating. Paul says heaven. he's in the invisible Elohim. Okay. That's what Paul says. Well, what I believe what Paul invisible? says. Paul, okay. Do you believe what Paul says here when he says that angels were the mediator when the law was given? I, I certainly believe that, that there could have been and were uh, angels there. I'm not going to deny what Paul says. Doug and I actually discussed this the other night. You know, in Acts 7, Stephen repeats the same thing. Well, again, I'm not denying what the text says. It says that there's angels there, but the text in Exodus, the one I'm referring to, does not say, Sean, it does not say angel of Yah. It says Yah. You guys. It says, that, it says no, Elohim. no, no. You guys, well, again, so do you think that Elohim is a lesser Elohim? You think it's like a Yeshua? Mm. Well, angels are no, lesser, we, right? And they're Elohim. 
correct? Well, I understand. So you think so, they're seeing Elohim then like an angel is who they're having covenant meal with. They were yes. there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so they're you not actually by, seeing... by the way, by the way, here's a great great opportunity. You guys know why? Because it was Shavuot. In the middle of the third of month, they're celebrating this. It's about marriage. Okay. Ju Jubilee says the angels have kept Shavuot since day one of since day four of creation. The, the, since, right. since the first year, since year one of creation, the angels have kept Shavuot once on, on, on one day out of the year every year in heaven. So they follow the law in heaven, too. So it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense that they would come down and commune with with the elders and Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, and all of them have a covenant meal uh, midway up Sinai. And as we see right here, again, if we define our terms in Exodus 24, 10, we see it says, but Elohim did not lay his hand on the Israel. They saw him. They ate and drank. This hymn is not in the is not in the Septuagint. It says they saw the God of Israel. So there is this is why I said at the beginning, I'm not trying to discount the Masoretic. I think it's very useful. I think it's very good. I think it's a reason it, it, we can learn the fullness of theology from it. I just think it would be disadvantageous to anyone truly studying out the scriptures to just dismiss the fact that it was literally created by rabbinic Judaism in the ninth century. And there's lots of rabbinical insertions in it that differ than the other texts that are out there like the Septuagint. What about what about Isaiah? The Masoretic about text. About I from my understanding I'm no scholar on this issue at all Sean by the way. I mean I've I've studied okay. enough to be somewhat familiar but from my understanding scholars say that the that the Dead Sea Scroll text is obviously it's not identical. There's some spelling issues, there's a few words here and there that are different but 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 that it's a very good, uh, and I wish we had more full scrolls like that, but it's my understanding, Doug probably knows this much better than me, that, that it actually shows that the Masorites didn't monkey with the text, at least the book of Isaiah. Is that correct, Doug? Or, or I, 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 ha I have a lot no, of... Uh, no way to validate that claim immediately, but okay, I hear you. And well, from no. my research, again, it's a very good example uh, okay. That we have a we have what we know is probably first second century text discovered in and and, it, and I just think it's just like Yah to let it be Isaiah fifty three as a witness which you know we're we're talking about and again guys we could sit here and go through scripture literally probably for for forty hours uh, mm -hmm. and 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 just discuss this and get, go over everything um, but I, I think Isaiah. If you do the research on it, and again, it's been years since I did this, um, that there's nothing that would change any major doctrine or text. In other words, if if the Masorites monkeyed around with the text, they didn't monkey around with Isaiah that much, according to what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's my understanding. But yeah, there could be a book. Look, I, I, mm -hmm. I, that's that's I, that's not my that's not my forte. I'm a I'm a general practice multi-practice lawyer i don't i don't study ancient languages and and i will admit my ignorance and because we're all ignorant in 99.99 percent of hmm. this creation anyway if not more can i, I can think I dr amp you're wanting to, oh, okay oh um, no, i just ahead. had that pulled up <laughs> i'm not sure if i yeah yeah you're just, <laughs> i didn't know if you wanted to speak on it or um, if you just wanted to show not necessarily so okay no. I just had a quick question for you, Doug. I, I, we're getting yeah. pretty late here, my time. It's almost midnight, so I might have oh, to bow it real soon, guys. But uh, in your opinion, Dr. Hamp, um, where is paradise? Where is paradise? Well, um, and what's in paradise? Ultimately, it's going to be back here on Earth. I mean, that's going to yeah. be the, you know, God Eden once again. Uh, God is going to restore the Earth as it used to be. Um, you know, if you're asking where is the new Jerusalem, it's behind some kind of a dimensional veil. Uh, the Bible talks about, you know, Isaiah says, oh, that he would rend the heavens and come down. Uh, Ezekiel saw the heavens open at the baptism of Jesus. The heavens were opened. Stephen being stoned, the heavens were opened. So there's some kind of a, a veil. I mean, I think Marvel Avengers does a pretty good job of, they sort of have these things open, right, in, in the midst of a just, in the mm -hmm. room, like a thing, a, like a, it's a, it's a decent picture. Okay. Uh, you know, so I think that there's, you know, we can't see it. We can't travel in a spaceship and get there. Eventually we can't go in a car there, but there, but there are doors. And I think, uh, I think the tower of Babel was such a door. Uh, I think, uh, people that are doing, you know, <laughs> magic mushrooms and, uh, seances and other things, they may be at, maybe able, 
they shouldn't, but they might be able to access some doorways to that other realm. So it's, it's, a, it's a different dimension, right? I cannot get there through any physical means. Um, okay. And um, I guess, okay, yeah. more so, I guess what I'm asking is like, what, what do you think is within paradise or within the New Jerusalem? Is it just like an empty, hollowed nothingness? We are. I, I, well, yeah, I think the actual no, like right, New Jerusalem. Not right when it comes. I mean, like where it's located right now. I Currently. Guess, yeah. Well, I think God is there, obviously. Um, I think it's kind of a, it's the mountain of God. It's a pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a mountain in there. Well, it is a mountain. It's not okay, a mountain. So it there's a mountain. mountain. Okay. The city is a mountain. It looks right. probably like a ziggurat to some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so coming could out, there be trees? Corrupting image four. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. There could be trees. You know, it's, it's okay. beautiful. Whatever animals, y'all animals, animals in there. <laughs> we definitely know there's streets of gold and, you know, there's yeah. pearly gates and all okay. that stuff, right? You so know, you guys so. believe there's tangible things? Yeah. Aspects to, okay. Absolutely. And is, is it far-fetched yeah. to believe that there could be animals? No, I think there's definitely. Well, there's going to be sacrifices in the millennium. Okay, they're going to be when it's here, though. I mean, like right now where it is. Yeah. We don't well, know. Apparently, it seems start. like there's horses. Yeah, horses yeah, okay. seem to be okay. there. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So why why do you guys think it would change if if we don't think that there's sacrifices in the kingdom of heaven above right now, but we do all acknowledge that when it comes to the ground, there will be. What's the change for? I don't why, know that the sacrifices is, will be in the no, new Jerusalem. I, I think I think you're missing the whole point of sacrifices. I really do. Really, the whole point okay. of sac. Yeah, I really do. So okay. Which, there I were mean, not there I'm were listening. no sacrifices needed before the fall, right? We all agree with that, I I suppose. Well, yes. well were you talking about for sin atonement? You, we all realize there's so, more than just sin atonement sacrifices, right? There's Thanksgiving well, joy, there's festival, sure. First fruits. But do we agree that there were no animal sacrifices before the fall? I don't know. It doesn't say. Interesting. So how did death come in? Through sin. Yeah. Okay, so there was no death. There were no sacrifices before. Well, it's you know it's somewhat the death of man, though, right? I mean, it's are you saying that every bug and everything that was created never died? The lifespan <laughs> of a fly is five days. <laughs> when you're biting into an apple, it didn't decay. Yeah, I, I I'm just correct. I'm it young Adam. I'm not young Earth. Um, I don't know, and I don't. Well, I don't know what the you know the uh, reproduction rate of bugs was back then. Okay, so I can't tell you about the bugs, but we clearly know from Romans chapter five that there was no death. For whatsoever man. no through anything doesn't say that it doesn't say that though that's an assumption right uh no well so when adam ate of the fruit what happened the ground was cursed on account of him the entropy set in yeah the ground inside of where he was or outside of where he was well so adam adam comes from the adama he is okay. the earth man. I, th I think uh, on record, his wife called him the dirt bag after he did all that stuff. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so Adam was sort of earth walking. Okay. He was the federal head of the planet of the dirt of the soil. And when death entered into him, death okay. entered into everything. And then we have in Romans chapter eight, it says that the creation is eagerly groaning to be we liberated agree. from the we bondage agree. of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, right? So the very dirt, was Adam rocks, puts inside the garden or because it was, wasn't he removed from the garden back to the land of his creation after he sinned? Yeah, Genesis says that. I don't know that. Genesis, Genesis, Genesis doesn't 3, quite say that, but, you, but I mean, well, okay. God certainly, we know, well, I don't think we have those details. We know that God took dirt and formed Adam, right? And then you it says he right placed here. him in the garden. Yeah. Well, you show me. So, so drove out the man and stationed him. Chairman. So therefore yep. the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So from he's, the he's ground removed. from right. not, not necessarily from, you know, the next neighborhood over, but from the dirt. Okay. Yeah. But so. he's taken out of, out of the, in, the place of the garden and there's a angel that guards. So they can't get back in the garden. Yeah. So that, so, like, we know that he was not created inside the garden. He was created from the ground of the earth. Right. And then when he re re transgressed, he was removed from that paradise and brought outside of it to back to the land which he had been taken. Mm -hmm. That's the way I read it anyway. I'm just, just throwing that out I, there. Hey, Sean, I, I, love, I love it when Yeshua says he's the way. 
the truth. Uh, we obviously know Torah, the law is truth. Yeshua is identifying and saying, hey, I am the in the flesh, walking, talking Torah. Yeah. And we have, in, uh, I like to I like to teach, if you could pull that verse back up real quick, I, when it talks about yep. There is there is uh, there is a whirling sword. So we see the sword here. We see the sword that comes from Yeshua's mouth. We have the flame again, guarding the way. And again, this is this this would be a metaphorical argument that when Yeshua says He is the way and the truth, um, I personally believe Yeshua is the lawgiver. And obviously, we have the tree of life because he, His way, His truth leads to life. And obviously. Um, you know, and this is where we agree, you know, the only way to the Father is through Yeshua and what he did for us, what he's doing for us, and what he will do for all mankind uh, upon his return. And then we got a thousand years. Uh, and I do, I, I, I've, I actually like what you point out in First Corinthians 15. You haven't brought it up yet, but where you talk about how uh, it's talking about the resurrection and, and Christ being the first fruits, Yeshua being the first fruits, then those at his coming, then the end, and then everything is then turned back over to the Father. And and maybe this, you know, and guys, I apologize for being passionate earlier. I've, I've, I've hopefully maybe my coffee has worn off. I think that might be what it is because <laughs> now I'm much more relaxed. But um, what I... What I'm seeing is when it goes back to the father, that eighth day, there is no eighth day. That would be the eternal state. I don't know what happens after death is defeated and after after it's turned back over to the father in eternity. I don't know what we do. OK, we, we I, I know everything is rolled back up yeah. into eternity. And then when we get there, I know what we're going to be doing during the millennium. I mean, there's. You know, I know we're going to be ruling and reigning. We're going to be priests and kings, you know. Wait, uh, what's the priest do? <laughs> what's the priest again, do? We're, we're, you know, uh, there's the going to be a Levitical not only system. sacrifice. That's well, and there's going to be a Levitical it's, it's system. The, it's I, the main job. No, the, it's, it's the main not. function of the it's, it's, it's a it job. Is. No. Okay, yeah. this no, will be my last question. I know no. we're all kind of. And as far as here. Adam was to work the Adama, the soil, the dirt, that's what he was taken from. It wasn't like he had to go to. You know, five neighborhoods over. I'm taking sending you back to where your old neighborhood, and you're going to work there. No, he was taken from well, the what, ground, the dirt. Well, then, how so, do you differentiate the garden as a special place versus everywhere else? Well, that was a special place. I mean, that's what a okay. gan is. So, in the in the paradise of God that comes back down out of heaven, we see yeah. for a thousand years uh, a temple set up with all these sacrifices going on. We get the full layout of the temple. We get. All this, even the tree of life is in Ezekiel 47, 12 listed for us with the leaves whose leaves are used for the, the healing of the nations, just like yeah. Revelation 22. So yeah. are these sacrifices taking place on screen here in Ezekiel 45 for feasts, new moons, Sabbaths, atonement, peace offerings, burnt offerings, grain yeah. offerings? Yeah, because you have people that will not have their new bodies yet. Only people that have their new body can go into the new Jerusalem. Okay. If you don't have it, you don't get to go in. We see that clearly in Revelation 22. Okay. Right. So then so, it says here, yeah, yeah. It, it says here in the same uh, same chapter mm -hmm. that the uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's actually chapter 44 right before it, that the Levites are the ones preparing this offering. OK, yeah, there's going to be a Levitical system reinstated in the millennium. I think we're all in agreement. Okay. on that. We're all agree. So yeah. so the people outside of the kingdom, even though this is taking place inside, by the way, but you're saying the people outside of the kingdom are outside are the eating, city, outside the city. Yeah. Well, the city is the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Well, because mm -hmm. Abraham a waited can, for an, a king's palace Abraham, is not the extent of his kingdom. I mean, that's in, in, in Hebrews eleven. It tells Abraham waited for a country, a city whose architect and builder is God. Okay. So yeah. either way, but if we think that this is taking place inside, uh, well, either way, you're, even if you don't want to put this inside, which clearly the descriptions tell us it is inside. But what, if though? you don't. If the inside the, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the city of God, the, well, the mountain I mean, of the Lord, the Zion that comes down out of heaven. No, it's, but it's, no, no, that's the new Jerusalem. So this right, right here in Ezekiel 44 is not happening in the new Jerusalem. We're told very clearly that there's no temple in the new Jerusalem. Uh, where, well, where, does, later, where does the water of life come from? Where does it, it, it flow comes, out from? Okay. So, well, my, my view is a little bit different than the average dude. So I think the new Jerusalem comes down to planet Earth, which is going to be restored 
uh, put back the way it's supposed to be, Garden Eden, if you will, uh, at the beginning of the millennium. And so the New Jerusalem is on the I planet. Agree. God is on top of this, and, and water is flowing out of his throne. It then goes down the sides of a pyramid, not a big cube. It goes down the sides of this pyramid, and it then flows out, right? And so the water is flowing in different directions. It's healing things. And the temple is somewhere in the vicinity near uh, the New Jerusalem. I don't know exactly where, but it's in the general area. And so the water is coming from God, because we see that that the the, the trees are exactly the same as in Revelation 22, and they're they're all for right. the healing so, of the nations. Mm -hmm. I agree, because yeah. right on screen I have in front of us here. Not only is the yeah. is the leaves for the healings of the nations, but it yeah. says the water flows from the sanctuary. Yep, yeah. that's that's a temple. And well, I, I understand that, and I, I've dealt with this passage, and you know, the, it, it is a little bit, little bit tricky trying to harmonize all of these different scriptures. But the way I see it is that the water, the source of the water, is coming from God's throne, which is on top of the New Jerusalem, and then it's flowing down the sides of that. Uh, we see that in uh, Psalm forty-five, forty-six, right in there that you know there's this water that makes glad the city of God. Um, and it, you know, it's going in these different directions. So again, the source of it is coming from God in the New Jerusalem, which is on the planet, and it's going by way of the uh, the temple, which is very much on the earth. And the temple and the sacrifices that are happening are for people that do not yet have their glorified bodies. The reason they need this is they need a covering. Yeah, the they need a force the field sacrifices. Yeah. Well, they need they need a personal sac they need a personal force field because the veil. The general veil between heaven and earth has been taken away. That's when the uh, heavens roll up like a scroll. And so that scroll, that veil between heaven and earth is protecting us from God in all of his fire. And um, so when Jesus comes back, that veil is taken away. And so now there are people who are still mortal. They are going to need um, a, a, a temporary stopgap measure, which are these sacrifices. Um, to cover them until they get their new bodies. And when they do get their new bodies, which they event, some of them will, some will decide to opt out, unfortunately. And, um, and then they're going to uh, eventually get their new bodies. Okay. And so how do they get their new bodies? Well, they have to wash their garments uh, in, in the river uh, and or keep his commandments, depending on how, which version you want to read on that one. Um, and then they have the right to go into the city through the gates and take for the tree of life. But outside of the dogs and the sorcerers and liars and all who practice and love and practice the lie, right? So whatever that verse is. So, um, but that, so there are people that cannot go in because nothing defiled or unclean can go into the city. Hence, there are dogs and sorcerers and liars uh, outside the city, people that are not following God's ways as they really ought to be. And they are given the sacrifices really as a very merciful measure. And then... When uh, Satan gets Those out, he's in... Those are people full of sin, right? Those well, are people full of sin? Yeah. That's I mean, what they these... need, the sin sacrifices. So yes, they're full of yes. sin outside the city. They need the sacrifices, but people right now who aren't resurrected don't need them, who are full of sin? So, again, the reason for the sacrifice in, at that time is because the general veil between heaven and earth, right? Respectfully, we... brother, I just don't see that in the text. Well, respectfully, I can show you if you want to. <laughs> sure, we're, I, I would love to see it. Take me to it. There's at least four places. So you got Ezekiel chapter one. I was sitting by the river Hebar when I saw the heavens opened. Okay, so no, I mean, I mean, go. what you're saying, the theological, the theological claim you're making is that when the heavens are opened, when the kingdom comes, the people suddenly now need sacrifices, whereas they, they didn't when the heavens were closed. No, I, what I'm suggesting is we need to go back further on what a covering is for. Okay. You use the term atonement, but I think that's a very vanilla, generic term. When the word is kippur or kapara, right, and it's it's uh, to kafa, right, it's to cover, right, and we see that even um, the altar needed to needed an atonement made for it. What did the altar do wrong, right? Did the altar somehow sin and like I need someone to cover for me, right? No, the altar itself needed a covering because. It was in the fiery presence of God. And so it needed something so that it would not be burned. What happened when God came down on Mount Sinai? It started burning, 
right? When Jesus comes back, what happens? The elements begin to melt because was, he is a consuming fire, right? And so when this covered? veil between, sorry. I'm sorry, was that was the fire Mount Sinai still blazing when Moses went up there for 40 days and 40 nights? Because they didn't say he had a covering of any kind. Well, I mean. What does the text say? I don't know. It doesn't say what's being implied. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, if the text doesn't say it, I think Doug's speculating and he really shouldn't speculate. No, we should not speculate on anything other than what the well, word of if God we're is. if we're t- if we're talking about if we're talking about the millennium, all right. So you're making a case about the millennium. I, true, I'm giving you my 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 theory about the millennium. Okay. Okay. But when it comes to the word uh, atonement, we're we're talking about the word kafa. All right. That means to cover. So we have to go back and understand what is a covering for. And it's so that you can okay. somehow be in some kind of presence of God. The, the general population can be in the presence of God. God wants to be near them. He wants to be with them. But we're the boy in the bubble. And if we come out and just hang out in the regular world, we're going to die. That, you know, that's what happens if we get too close to God. He's a consuming fire. I don't think it's speculation. I think it's just connecting a couple dots. And okay. we have an well, incredible what, story. Why is it so egregious when I try to connect the dots and say... Okay, if we see consistency in Yahweh's word, if he does not change, as he tells us in Malachi, and Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, forever, Hebrews 13, if Father and the Son are the same, regardless of how you guys see the relationship between the Father and the Son, they're both called the same. So why would they instruct mankind to do thing activity A over here, but then over here, activity A is no longer relevant? When I'm showing a bunch of verses where activity A is still being done, I mean, okay, we got I'm even after Yeshua. Was, I, I was after, trying to answer you. Okay, once I'm sorry. You after Yeshua, I'm I'm I apologize. I'm finishing the question. So in Acts 21, Yeshua has already ascended to heaven, and the disciples are still doing sacrifices at the temple on the ground. They're, and they they didn't think that it was a waste of time or pointless or that it was non-effectual. In fact, it was how Paul proved he was actually orderly and walking according to the law mm-hmm. to pacify the other disciples. So I, that's my question is why, why are you guys using a dispensational mentality? Mm-mm. Cause the no, Torah doesn't teach don't. dispensation. No, no, I don't. I, I, I now despise dispensationalism again. I, I do believe Sean that you're conflating Yeshua's role according to the order of Melchizedek to the Levitical priesthood role. That, that is how I understand exactly what you're teaching as far as as far as in the heavenlies right now you you would have yeshua offering i guess they would be celestial bulls at the feast of tabernacles i do not believe that's happening right well are there celestial trees and celestial mountains well well, again i do not believe that yeshua we just we differ on this and and listen was manna the bread of heaven or not well, manna literally fed them, yes. Okay. And it Is literally it came heaven from heaven. And Yeshua said he is okay. the bread of life. I believe he's the word of God. Every When Yeshua was confronted and tempted by Satan, he quoted scripture. And he said, you know, uh, I, again, I wish I had your recall, dude. I really do, Sean. Where he talks about uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth sure. of God. Sure. And so, again... I see all these types and shadows, and this is what, this is where the two of us, at least, and Ken, I haven't listened to much of your teachings. This is where the two of us, and the way I understand this, and again, I will apologize again about being passionate and feisty. That's that's my nature as, a, as you know, I want to cross-examine you and put you in the witness stand, and I, I, I'm sorry, okay? I'll apologize again. But where we fundamentally mis- disagree, okay, is... I see types and shadows of which Yeshua is the substance. In other words, a tree casts a shadow. It's not the entire tree. In John 5, 39, I believe, everything that was written in Genesis through Malachi was all about Yeshua. Everything. In other words, it all pointed to him on the road to Emmaus. Yeshua is opening up the scriptures to them and teaching them that everything is pointing. He is, 
he is the the rock. He is the savior. He is the redeemer. He is the king. He's the high priest. He's the kinsman redeemer. He's the chief cornerstone, the capstone. All of these metaphors that apply to Yah in 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 scripture, in in the Hebrew scriptures from and I hate saying Old Testament, but from he from from Genesis all the way through Malachi, I I may be missing one where Yah calls himself a, B, C, D, E, where Yeshua doesn't doesn't use that and apply it to himself. In other words, and, and again, you know, when when, I, when Philip back? is asking, just real quick, when Philip says, show us the Father, and Yeshua says, have I been with you so long, Philip? When you see me, again, because the Father, no one has ever seen, but when you see me, you have seen the father. And again, I, I'm, I am a simple, from a small okay. town dude, I do That's take the text literally. I do uh, understand the metaphors. And, and again, I believe even father's son is an example, a teaching device in which an infinite creator who loves us so much is, is, is describing we're also adopted sons. He is our husband. We are his wife. But again, the shadow picture that we even see from uh, from Adam and Eve, it is not good for man to be alone. Well, we haven't really talked about this, but why? And my friend Curtis and Michael do a great job. Why did why did Yah even do this? Why are we born fallen? What we have my no question in that. You're stealing my question. Let me jump in. If these are shadow pictures, if these are the, if the substance equals Christ and these are copies and shadows done on the ground, did Yahweh consider the copies and shadows done on the ground for, for atonement and for peace offerings and for festivals and for first fruits? Did he consider, the, consider those like serious? Did he take those seriously? Those, yeah, they're if those total are, shadows. But so they're copies, they're copies and shadows. It doesn't Just say like the, well, the temple. Well, actually, it's too. It, but it, it, but it, the okay, physical so temple is not eternal. Right. I mean, that's I understand. A... But if they're copies and shadows, why did Yahweh take it so seriously that he struck down Nadab and Abihu? Because they brought if, in. If they're just copies fire. and shadows and they're so all practicing. Are. No, you, again, I, you're I conflating things. You're conflating. OK. So they so brought in a different form of fire. I didn't answer your question, Sean. This, this well, is. I, uh, I didn't quite ask it. I didn't quite ask a question. I, I was trying to. You I was did. adding to what you were saying. So all I'm trying to say is. If we're if we're saying that the temple on the ground that there was a copy and a shadow was just a, a momentary thing, and we all agree because it was prophesied to go away. It was prophesied to go away until the New the Jerusalem returns. Came. Right. No, until New Jerusalem returns. Right. So this is the resurrection of the dead, the kingdom come. That's when cool. we're going to see the reinstatement of the, the priesthood on the earth. Until then, if they build another temple in Jerusalem, that's not ordained by God. Is that a question did or just, a statement? I'm, I just, I'm thinking maybe I struck another nerve that mm, we haven't talked no, about. No, is yet. that a question so, or a statement? Do y'all agree with that? Do y'all think that if they if Israel builds a temple today that it's legitimate? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough I mean, Now, Rico, okay. anybody why, why, why don't we skip temple? that one? Because, I mean, we it, could go. That's anybody fine. that that's studies, fine. anybody that's, I'm sure most of your audience might be familiar with Rico. Uh, I had him on my yeah. uh my show one time and 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 we actually uh we're gonna have to change it to sunday doug but rico wants to come on and talk to us about this very question okay um, okay cool no so all i'm saying is <laughs> all i'm saying is we see over and over again all throughout the scriptures and the prophets that yahweh is defending his house on the ground that's how seriously he took it and that was just the copy and we have direct in Exodus 25, 26, 27, hebrews 8 it directly tells us that was a copy of the true tabernacle in heaven so why would he have a true, the real thing up there that doesn't behave anything like the copy? And he literally killed people over the copy. And, and I just don't understand where, the logic or the exegesis. No, of this here's the I, I feel like this is all, all those duties are going look, away. Can I answer this, know? Doug? Here's the fundamental, again, difference. I understand what you're saying. I think you, what, what, what you're calling the temple in heaven, heaven is creation. In other words, I believe this temple in heaven, that would be Yeshua is in the third heavens right now. Yeshua is in the space time continuum. What I am discussing as the father is outside of creation. 
So in other words, out, he, he is so much more than just the third heavens, the second heavens, the first heavens, or even earth. No matter, and, and again, I don't do shape arguments, by the way. I just really don't. But regardless of the model you look at, if you drew a dome or you drew a square or you drew a circle, and then you have earth, first, second, third heaven, and you have it, you have third heaven, then, then what we know, and, and I believe this is how his word has communicated to us, what we have outside of creation would be the father. And that's why Yeshua can say, no one has seen the father. So what I'm saying, when they, when someone sees the, the ancient of days sitting on the throne, when someone sees Yah, the most high Elohim in those, in those visions, uh, is it is certainly lesser than the eternal almighty Yah that exists outside of space and time. So okay? now and, and, and that's the just best not, way I can describe it. You're literally just describing something scripture doesn't describe. You're literally just saying all the prophets and what they saw and described as heaven or the father or angels or the son. That's not a true representation. No, no, they never say, they never say father, Sean, not one time. No, okay. they don't. Show me in the text where it ever says they yeah. saw the father. Brothers, respectfully, I'm, yeah. I'm fading it, here. It's late. It's late. Yeah, I, get you. I think I, we all I are. do appreciate this conversation, though. I, I had Thank a good you. time with you guys yeah. for sure. I'd love to do it again if you're willing. Uh, yeah. I just yeah. I'm on willing. Atlantic Standard Time, so I I'm three hours ahead of you guys, so or <laughs> well, at least Sean. So yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and Sean, that was something we discussed, you, and I didn't like the time. official objections, but in the text, it never says anybody saw the father. It says they saw Yah. And that's where we're differing. You're saying that's the father. I'm saying that's Yah. Okay. I'm saying, I'm saying you have to show me. I get you. I get you. I would just, this okay, will be so my last guys. statement and I'll let everybody have right. Okay. Thank you, Ken. I'll let everybody have their final word. Uh, I would just say, if that's your belief, brother Scott, you'd have to show me the the divine oracles of God that actually teach that specifically and tell and explain where he actually is. Because all we do get from the prophets is, is him being in the, the highest heavens, the heaven of heavens as Deuteronomy 10, 14 explains. And that's where the father's yeah. temple is. Psalm 133. Okay. We agree. So, all right. All right. You I appreciate that. The father I'm saying it's Yah. We agree. You we were saying that. that's Definitely. the father. I'm saying that's Yah. And he manifests within his space time creation. Okay. And and so that's where, and again, for anybody in the audience, if they really, really, really want to get an in-depth teaching on this, Michael spends like 40 hours breaking this down with no interruption hey, and with the text. And you Michael, and Michael, if you're watching, I would different. love for to have you to come on. I'd love to invite you. He does not do these. He, he doesn't. Okay. And again, I kind of so, agree. So, yeah, um, if I could, I have seriously quick slides uh, okay, if, cool. you're, if you're okay with that. Are these here? Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah, awesome. Okay, yeah, so like uh, yeah, so just really quickly. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with, toward, or facing. That's the word pros, proston theo. And pros is your face, essentially. Your prosopos yeah. is the face, right? So I, I so I have, you know, just a, a, got a, a cheap little graphic here. But um, what I'm suggesting here is that, you know, God is looking in the mirror here, God the Father, and he's and the Son is looking back. And so, and the word was with God. The last phrase there is a predicate it's saying the lad, latter part was God is describing who the word is. So just really quick on that. I know there's a whole bunch more. These, this is the last slide I want to just point out. Um, so mm -hmm. all, um, well, so Isaiah, there is no other God besides me, a just God and a savior. So I think, I hope we're all in agreement. That's talking about Jehovah. There's none beside me. And then we in first Timothy one by the commandment of God, our savior, uh, first Timothy two, three, for it is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior, According to the commandment of God, our Savior, uh, Titus, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. And then Second Peter, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, Jude 125. So, you know, putting those together, we, we see that uh, who is God, our Savior? Jesus. Jesus is God, our Savior. So I will end with that. Uh, that's where I stand on this whole thing. I awesome, want to thank brother. you for having me on. Thank you for uh, thank you for that. And, and, yes, Scott. Just, and just real quick, I just look at Yeshua as the image of the invisible, Most High, Yah, if you will. In other words, it is okay. very. That's why he can say the Father is greater than I. He he is a perfect image and representation within within the creation, if you will. And so that's that's just a kind of a simple maybe understanding. But when it when when Yeshua says no one has seen the Father, I take that to mean 
the angels, Satan uh, and Job, when they go before the throne, before when they go before Yahweh, I don't believe they're going before what, what we are later learn as the father. And so I think everything within creation uh, is no doubt Yahweh. And I just see father, son as a teaching device. I do not deny Yeshua as the father. Yesh I mean, Yeshua, the son coming in the flesh. I just don't view them as two different gods or two different persons, just just ways that the word communicates truth to us. And we're kidding ourselves. I mean, none of us have perfect understanding, the perfect wisdom, perfect knowledge. Within six months, Sean, I might I might would come back on and discuss this and go, dude, I have a completely different understanding. Because again, six months, not six months ago, six years ago, I had I, you know, I, I thought pork was okay. okay. So we all yeah. are so and, and you're excellent on this. You're excellent okay. on this, by the way. I so think you are really trying to test the word. You're trying to examine yeah. scripture. You are trying to really, you know, get a lot of the Catholic leaven out of your understanding of scripture. And this is just something where, again, I believe in one Yah, one most high, you do too. I just believe okay. Yeshua is also Elohim most high, just in a limited state when he appeared as the son. Okay. Awesome. So in the meantime, so if, if your opinion might change in six months, would you just do me a favor from now till the next six months and just consider what I said. And in the meantime, don't consider me someone that's profaning the cross of Christ or the work of the blood of, the, of this atonement or de de denying the deity of Christ. None of that stuff. All I'm sitting here saying is I'm saying, look, I'm putting words on screen and I'm trying to define the words. And I appreciate you guys helping me tonight. Look at some of these words and give us your interpretations and, and breakdowns and, and, Sean, and exegesis. I, Doug and I have not done that. We have not called you a heretic. We have not okay. said that you're out of the faith. I mean, I have had personal friends that are on the board with Doug and I for our understanding of when the new covenant will be fully realized, call me a heretic. I've had another brother for my view that the father is outside of time right. and the son is how express. He called me a heretic. He said, I'm and I have an antichrist spirit. You've not heard that. I've been passionate in, in cross examining you. I've been right, passionate, right. but I'm, I'm by no means. Do, do I think there's some problematic issues with Jubilees? Yes. But I'm not going to call you a heretic because you believe and teach Jubilees or Enoch or these other books. I'm just we've gotten that that word is just got Roman Catholic leaven on it so bad. And I hope I mean, although I've been passionate and, 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 and you know, asking questions about the text and the text doesn't say angels like when I was asking Ken, the text just says, yeah, I'm not calling you a heretic. We can for this take a time that in the meantime you're welcome to send me emails or questions uh, messages uh, about your questions on jubilees i'll be happy to address them we do a full series on our channel um, as well as on our king's episodes where we review it in depth and the theology taught and the history of it the manuscript history everything involved with it so yeah just if if you're interested you're welcome to shoot me questions I'll, i'm glad to take some time for you but uh pastor pastor hamp i really appreciate you coming on i think this was a joy thank to have you. both of you guys on here tonight and um, thank you. guys if y'all haven't already check out uh doug hamp's channel on youtube and then scott harwell also has a channel on youtube and um you guys can check those <laughs> guys, out guys normally yeah. i'm on with people and we're just chatting about stuff and not really differing that much so it's that's uh, okay this is how we learn right because if i've missed something in my putting the dots together and then maybe something that uh, pastor Hamp showed tonight, helped me with that. Well, I'm going to take it home and work with it and see if I can, you know, and that's the idea of, of, we have to talk when we disagree. Otherwise it's echo chambers. We don't want that. Yeah, so, so I really appreciate you guys. And none of us, Sean, none of us, none of us are sitting here teaching what we don't think we understand to be truth. Yeah. I mean, you Thank know, you for I having mean, us. you're not intentionally saying, well, I I'm teaching falsehood. You, you are teaching to the best of your ability. I'm stating what I believe to the best of mine, and Doug is, Doug is, and we're all just limited, finite human beings. We are. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to end the program now, and uh, I really hope everyone in the live chat has enjoyed this and got something out of it. Uh, thank you so much for the super chats. Sorry I couldn't get to them earlier, but I uh, really appreciate everybody being here, and hopefully this will be something we can watch again and study and see what's going on again. So hope to have you guys back on. Y'all have a wonderful night. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thanks, brothers.